Okay. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the December 4th, 2017 Lake Washington School Board meeting. I'll entertain a motion to approve the December 4th agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Director Liberty, seconded by Director Bleasner. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, hearing none, motion carries. Okay, uh, important stuff, so I believe we have some oaths of office to take. We do, we are very excited to have a new board member, Cassandra Sage, to uh, take the oath of office this evening, as well as a returning board member, Mark Stewart, who is also taking the oath of office this evening. So our first agenda item will be that, so what I will do is ask Mark and Cassandra to join me in front of the dais, and I will um, read the oath of office. It's a repeat after me uh, oath, and then uh, we'll get some pictures of you and some pictures of you and your family uh, if your family members are present. So, okay, ready? All right. Yes, Patrick, no. Mark, this is old hat for you, right? <laughs> this is old hat for you. You're, we already got the family picture. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, fantastic. It's nice to have a full board again. Um, and now we are on to the host school for the evening. Um, I believe we have uh, Nell Ballard Jones from North Star. Yes. Welcome, Nell. Nell's here, Thank you. principal at North Star Middle School, home of the Penguins. And uh, we are excited to hear your whole school presenta presentation this evening. Thank you. Um, Mr. Waddles is uh, dressed up a little bit today. It's kind of chilly, even for penguins. Um, so North Star Middle School is on the Emerson High School campus in the Houghton neighborhood of Kirkland. Um, the campus houses three very different choice schools, North Star, which we're here to talk about tonight, uh, Emerson K-12, which is our district's parent partnership program, and Emerson High School, which is our district's alternative high school. There are three physical office spaces, one campus, and one principal. Who North Star, who we are at North Star? Um, North Star was a, one of the first choice schools started in the region 
not only in the district, founded in 1981 by parents, teachers, and community members looking for, an, at that time, an alternative to the junior high experience. Um, the founding families came out of Community School, which is on the ICS Community School campus. Um, North Star started and still is an intentionally small program of 90 students, 30 at each grade level, six, seven, and eight. And we're a community school that is very active and supportive in our community and with the collaboration of our parent group, which is the North Star Advisory Committee. What we do and how we do it. We have multi-age thematic studies, um, highly engaging standards-based courses that are semester long instead of year long courses. So just by looking at the displays that we have here, behind you are Fantasy Island topographical maps that come from a foundational social studies class where students look, learn the basics of social, economic, political systems and geography and they do that in a semester long class where they are building their own ideal nation and country um, throughout the semester. Um, we are growth focused, academic and social learning in rigorous classes. Our SBA and MSP scores are above both the district and state average. Um, our SIP goals are focused on moving our students from level three proficiency to level four primarily. Um, we really also focus on character development, responsibility, and accountability, and we do that through support group and, and advisory, which are four days a week, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a little while, and biannual conferences that are student-led with teacher advisors. So it's similar to an elementary model where students are having progress reports and check-ins with teachers and advisors, and we find that at a school that is purposefully small, it's really important to maintain those really strong relationships between school and home. We're also community connected. Again, the North Star Advisory Committee. Um, we volunteer both as a school and as parents within our school community. We go on monthly field trips all over Western Washington and occasionally to Canada every couple years. Um, and we have conference week at the end of each semester where we bring in community experts in topics as wide ranging as astrophysics to Bollywood dancing to culinary arts. Um, and during those conferences where students and parents are meeting with their advisors, kids are also participating in enrichment coursework that is really connected to the community and the world at large. We believe that all of our students can meet and exceed high expectations when they are supported in a close-knit close -knit, um, environment with in-depth thematic teaching and learning. <clears throat> we believe that students can meet and exceed rigorous grade level standards in a creative school setting that focuses on academic excellence, service learning, social skills development, and personal responsibility. Our work. We're standards-based, again, um, teaching and assessing, Common Core State Standards, Next Gen Science Standards, and the District Power Standards. Non-traditional courses um, allow for student choice and allow for diverse educational experiences. Another example from our board is here we've got um, Green Cities Project from our biomimicry class, which is a um, class that blends engineering principles with biological sciences, looking at human design inspired by nature to solve human real world problems. <clears throat> and if you're interested, we have the biomimicry fair in January. <laughs> the challenges of an intentionally small 90 student program are that our data sets are pretty small. Each of our grade levels have 30 students. And so if one student decides not to test or opt out, or two students don't, don't do particularly well on a given day, that really can swing our data in pretty large, large, um, large ranges. Um, we have staffing limitations just because we're small. Um, so we have a limited special education, sa safety net, and counseling services. Um, we also had some shared staff. We also have to sort of modify a little bit some of the district-wide work to make sure that everyone has balance. 
Um, we have singleton teachers, so my science teacher is the only science teacher. Social study teacher is the only social studies teacher. But we also really want to be part of the community within the district, so it's important that we get out of North Star and engage with the larger district. And that's how some of our successes are sort of represented. Um, we have lots of accolades, Washington State Achievement Awards, 90 to 100% of our students consistently meet and exceed standards. Um, our professional growth and evaluation goals, those are the goals that teachers set, are really focused on individual student growth because every single student is known by every single teacher. We have a dedicated and collaborative staff, um, four full-time teachers who prepare for four to five courses per, year, per semester, so about eight per year. Three out of the four teachers have been at North Star for more than 12 years, the other one for more than seven. We have a special education teacher who, while at North Star only part-time, is on campus full-time, and so the accessibility is really important, and that's one of the ways that we work to support the students that we have. And we offer a before school safety net class for students who are struggling or needing a little additional help. And in a neighborhood school, that class might be embedded within the school day, but giving our staffing, we can't do it that way. So that we have to just kind of tweak and do it a little bit differently to make sure that our students are still getting the support they need, but it might look a little bit different at North Star. And finally, <clears throat> our connections with NAC, um, both resource support and time. Um, the support group class that I mentioned earlier meets four days a week. Every single student and every single family is known and meets with school staff at least twice a year. And we partner with Youth East Side Services for counseling on campus because we don't have a normal district counselor. And so again, it's really important that our kids have access to support that way. And the way that we do it is just a little bit differently. And we've been lucky to have the support of the district to allow us to do it in a slightly different way, but still getting kids the support that they need. What our data says. We're a high achieving school. We have a really high attendance rate. One of the lowest discipline rates per, per capita, I guess, uh, in the district and in the state, and a very low attrition rate. Usually when students come to us, they stay with us, just like with our staff. Why we're proud, um, teacher leadership at a school that's as small as North Star, teachers really have to take the lead on getting things done and doing things creatively. We have active and engaged families. We have rigorous and relevant coursework and inspiring and inspired students. Our opportunities for growth are like a lot of choice schools, ensuring that our demographics mirror those of the larger district. Um, being all things to all people, really just means I know we can't be all things to all people, but what are the supports that we need to put in place as a system so that all kids can access our program if they really want to? And differentiate, differentiating instruction within the general education setting so that all students, whether they need English support or safety net support or special education support, can still access our school and access our fabulous program. That is my presentation for the evening. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could Thank I you ask so just much, one favor? Oh, yeah. Could you make sure to send the dates for your biomimicry engineering fair? Yes. That would be great. If you send those to me now and Diane will make sure that that gets passed along to the board. Yes. Great. Thank yes, you. I will. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so now we're on to a fun event for the evening. We're on to the recognition of our national merit semifinalists and commended scholars. Um, students, uh, if you haven't been forewarned about this, one of the things we'd like to hear from you is at some point you're going to be handed a microphone up here. We'd like to know what you are thinking about studying in college, where you'd like to study in college, and one minute as in short, short, but one minute short story about a teacher who made a real difference in your life. All right, with that, uh, who are we hey, starting so with? we have two schools. two schools this evening, and uh, we're going to begin with Tesla STEM High School. So Principal Cindy Duane is, is here, and Cindy's going to make her way up to the front. And we're glad to have you here this evening, Cindy. 
Welcome. Thanks for having us here this evening. And Nell, what a great school. What a great presentation. Thank you. Um, just a few words about the National Merit Scholarship Program. So this program is a United States Academic Scholarship Competition, and it's for recognition and university scholarships, and it's administered by the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. The program began back in 1955. Finalists and semi-finalists are given recognition for their academic and extracurricular achievements, and commended students and scholars are named on the basis of nationally applied selection index scores that change every year. Um, with that said, I'd like to invite, can I at this time, invite Tesla STEM scholars up here. Don't be shy, I know some of you are here. Come on up. Yeah, why, well, I instructed them a little bit differently. Okay, so do you want them to Okay, okay, so here's the big test of the evening, scholars. Yeah, so, face your parents. Here, They're the ones who want. And, and also remember, you're on TV. No. So just so you know, what we uh, talked about this uh, earlier today was that the students would introduce themselves, name the college that they are most wanting to go to or have already been accepted to, talk just a tiny bit about a major academic area of interest, and instead of thanking just, uh, we, we didn't say just a teacher, we said thank you to someone who really made a difference, whether it's a teacher, a mentor, a coach, a, a minister, whoever that might be. I am Artemis Stapchuk. Uh, I really want to study computer science in college. I would love to get admitted to either MIT or University of Washington. And uh, somebody, a, a teacher slash mentor who made a difference in my life is a certain Alexander Vashilo. Uh, he isn't a teacher from any of my schools, but uh, he teaches a uh, math, math circle that I go to, uh, which kept up my interest in math and computer science throughout the years. Hi, I'm Christina Goto. A college that I'm interested in is University of Southern California, and I'm interested in studying bioengineering and political science. And um, someone who has really helped me throughout my high school experience is Ms. Duenas, especially last year um, when we did research projects, she was definitely helpful with supporting me and my partner in whatever we needed help with and encouraging us and getting us the connections that we needed to work with an elementary school as well. So I'm just grateful for her and all the opportunities that she's given us. Hi, I'm Vaishnavi Fadness. Um, I would like to major in either molecular biology or biochemistry in college, and I would like to attend Johns Hopkins University. Um, and one teacher who I think has really made a difference in my life is Ms. Allender. Um, she taught me AP Psych and Forensics at STEM last year, and more than that, um, she got me into science fairs, and I found my passion, which is biomedical research, thanks to her. I'm Rashida Hakim. I'm interested in studying electrical engineering or some other form of engineering in college, and I would like to attend the California Institute of Technology. And I'd like to thank my parents and my other family for supporting me through this whole high school and college application process, as well as um, my AP physics teacher, Mr. Saxby, for always being willing to answer, have long conversations about physics problems. Hi, my name is Prerna Kulkarni. Um, I would like to study applied mathematics in high school, and I think um, one school that I'm really interested in is the University of Washington. Um, a teacher that's made a really big impact on me, even though all my teachers made a huge impact on me, is Mr. Leslie, um, because he kind of, the projects we do in his engineering classes are things that I just never expected to be able to do ever. Like this, semester we're working on building bottle rockets and they're so much fun to do and I think um, he's one of the reasons that I'm interested in engineering now so I'd like to thank him for that. Hi my name is Salil Conaday and I'd like to study biochemistry in college. 
Um, I would like to attend the University of Washington, and I think one teacher that's made a big impact on my life is Ms. Newman for helping me um, through all my, through helping me um, expose my love for science and really finding my passion for biology. Um, my name is Avin Daouz. Uh, I'd like to study physics or political science, and hopefully I'll get into University of British Columbia. And I'd like to thank my parents, especially my mom. She's taking a video um, right up there. And she's uh, helped me through this crazy time of high school, and I know I wouldn't be able to get here without her. So thanks, Mom. Hi, I'm Artem. I'd like to study computer science in Rochester Institute of Technology, and I'm going with their prompt because it's far more interesting. Um, <laughs> Uh, this one time in a uh, psychology class, the psychology teacher was not there, and uh, Mr. Lenick, our history teacher, came in to sub, and after having mispronounced someone's name, he sang the whole tomato tomato song to us uh, off the top of his head. And that was so bizarre that it threw me off kilter and I haven't been the same since. <laughs> All right, now uh, hold still, and parents, if you want to take pictures of them, kids, go ahead and step back where the light's a little bit better behind the podium and uh, cl get cl closer to each other. Step back towards us, there we go, yeah. And parents, come on up and there you go. <laughs> you can stand behind the podium, it'll look important. There we go, perfect. Very nice. Okay, now, um, Traditionally, at some point, we're going to ask the kids to applaud their parents and ask all the parents to stand up. I think since we've got three schools, we'll actually do that. Two, only two schools? In that case, STEM parents, stand up. Kids? Yeah, parents. Boy, you're here. I know you're here. <laughs> Good job. OK, fantastic. Um, anything to wrap it up or Ms. Duenas? No. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Okay. You're good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, and next. Great. So so fabulous to have Tesla STEM here. It's equally fabulous to have Juanita High School here. So Joe Gorder, associate principal of Juanita High School, is here to introduce our scholars from Juanita High School. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. And I'm I'm proud to be here to represent the the staff and administration of Juanita High School, and uh, to recognize. We have uh, two National Merit semifinalists and 10 National Merit, Merit um, uh, Commended Scholars. Um, not all of whom are here tonight, but uh, want to be able to recognize all of them. Um, and also, one thing that I noticed is, you know, a lot of times you, you look in the, the, the National Merit Qualifying Test is one of the, the main, uh, is how students, you know, ultimately qualify for this recognition. But one thing I want to recognize is, is just that that the students continue to push themselves and challenge themselves and take the most rigorous coursework that they possibly can. And in talking to their teachers, um, they work with them. To a T, they all said that these are the, the hardest working, most intellectually curious um, students. And, uh, and so it goes, it goes way beyond just uh, your score on a test. OK, so if the Juanita High School student could please come on up, I appreciate it. Hello, my name is Kendall, and I'm in the Cambridge program at Juanita High School. And in college, I want to study Spanish and chemistry. I'm not entirely sure where I'm going to study yet, but I'm interested in the UW and Dartmouth College. And the teacher that's definitely made the most impact in my life is Mr. Bailey, who's a chemistry teacher. At first, I was really nervous when I was going to take chemistry because I didn't have any exposure to it beforehand. But I quickly learned that he teaches with insane amounts of dedication and passion and creativity. And he makes everything so attainable and so understandable that it was impossible not to fall in love with the subject. So I'm so grateful for that. And he is the reason that I want to study chemistry in college. Hello, my name is Shadi Marifarazan. And I'm also in the Cambridge program at Winnie High School. Um, and I hope in college to study applied and computational mathematics with perhaps an emphasis on economics and international relations. Um, per a school that I perhaps want to attend, who knows yet, but um, Stanford University or University of Southern California. And a teacher or 
more like a mentor who's been really important to my high school experience um, is Ms. Meg Lewis. She's the coordinator for the Cambridge program at Juanita High School. And not only is she the reason why this program that has absolutely changed my life exists, um, but she's the reason that all the teachers there who I consider equally influential exist. And she is a constant present mentor who comes to visit us every single day, everybody, at least it feels like that making sure that we're all prepared for college, making sure that we're all happy in our classes, and just making sure that we're happy and healthy people, which I think is the most important part when you're applying to God knows how many colleges. So thank you, Ms. Lewis. Hi, I'm Madeline Colantis. I'm also in the Cambridge program at Juanita. Um, I hope to study linguistics at, in college, um, and I hope to attend Pomona College. Uh, one teacher who's made a big difference in my education has been uh, Miss Alexandra Leal. She's been my Spanish teacher for three years now. Not only has she done an excellent job in immersing me in the Spanish language, of course, but also the Spanish culture through teaching us Spanish TV shows and articles and lectures and essays and things like that. Um, and she's truly fostered in me the love for language that I hope to pursue in the future. Hi, my name is Rachel Wakama. I'm not in the Cambridge program, but I've heard wonderful things about it. <laughs> I hope to study health and society in um, college, and I'm really looking at the co uh, Wellesley College in Massachusetts. Um, and one teacher who's really had a huge impact on me is um, at Juanita High School, we have a STEM program. And my STEM global health teacher has been really influential in helping me to see medicine from so many different angles. And we do tons of discussions in that class. We read a ton of books. Um, and we were talking one time, I can't quite remember what about, um, but it had to do a lot with medical research and the ethics that go into it. And I raised my hand and I said to her, I think, in this world, we're moving really fast in this day and age, and we're making so many new things, but I think it's really important to make sure that our morals catch up with us. And she looked me dead in the eye and she said, we must put that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that support and that openness um, has just always been with me throughout um, the entire time that she's been teaching me and supporting me, and I really do appreciate that. So as before, um, parents, this is your photo op moment. Uh, ladies, if you just take three steps backwards towards us, so you're in the light, um, and any parents who, yeah, parents will, parents will be parents. Okay, so um, once again, um, were all of our parent parents standing? Or did some of them not get up and take pictures? Because the parents of these kids, up. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, and so there's not, it's just these two schools tonight? Okay, fantastic. Well, again, a huge congratulations to all of you. I'm still a little jealous about not being a merit scholar. Um, I'll get over it someday, but not yet. Um, and uh, for those of you who are thinking about going to USC, I, I strongly recommend Pomona. Um, it's not that I'm biased or Stanford, um, but USC definitely not. Um, <laughs> And uh, for those of you who are keeping score, um, I, if we count linguistics as half of a STEM, uh, I think that it's uh, 13 to two and a half. So uh, good job, kids. Um, I, I'm proud of you. We're all proud of you. So Chris, just to explain a little more what, what uh, Director Carlson does during our commended scholars <laughs> is because he is in the STEM field, he's a scientist, he likes to tally how many students are potentially interested in studying STEM fields after high school. So that was your 13 yes. to 2, is that yes. correct? And okay. Yes, tonight was pretty standard. We had two of you, so two half persons who were interested in poli-sci and a linguistics. Health and society, I'm counting you as STEM because that's public health and that's where 
where I work. Um, anyway, but uh, it's just something statisticians do to keep themselves I didn't count entertained. This, I didn't so, count the journalism job. majors. I know, and curiously, you never make a table. All right, so um, with that, usually uh, we would now have a period for open comment. Um, I don't currently have anyone signed up for open comment. Uh, and I have a whole bunch of teenagers who have school tomorrow in the audience, including one, I was surprised not to see the little guy up here. I mean, the kids are getting younger every year. Um, but uh, yeah, if you've got a kid, uh, now would be a good time to take them home and do homework, because the rest of this is our business meeting, and honestly, your homework's more valuable to you. You really think that these students would want to do homework? Thank you for coming. <laughs> All right, so. Okay, um, so once again, uh, there was no one who actually signed up, but sometimes people who intend to speak to the board don't know how the protocol works. So is there anybody left in the audience who would like to speak to the board? Fantastic. Come on up. Um, so the way that this works, um, we've got a microphone in the center, um, and I, I won't read you the whole nine yards. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to see what might be students. Um, we don't get this very often, so this is a very special thing. There are only two things you don't comment on unless, you don't comment on individual people unless right. you're saying they're awesome. Um, and uh, the, uh, you have officially three minutes, given that there are only the two of you, we might let you run over. But there's a nice stoplight over there. When okay, it goes great. yellow, you've used up two minutes. When it goes red and beeps, that's at the end of your three minutes. Typically, we okay. ask people to roll, wind it up. But again, you're students, we might give you a little more leeway than average. So okay. with that, tell us who you are, where you're from, and then your three minutes start. Thank you. So should we state our address? Uh, you don't need to state your address, okay. just which school do you go to? The mic's okay. not currently on, so Matt's gonna turn it on. Sure. Um, it's, it's a fairly sensitive mic, so just make sure that it's pointed at your mouth. Okay. Is it green? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Devishi Thakur. My name is Supriya. And we're both students from Tesla STEM High School. So, uh, hello, we are the Sustainability Ambassadors. And we are here to share our updates on the student-to-student -student sustainability kickoff that was held at STEM last October. Just to provide some context, our goals for the kickoff were to, one, promote green team actions in schools. Two, provide professional development for student leaders across the district. Three, Connect and expand student-led sustainability efforts. Four, strive for 100% of schools participating in the King County Green Schools program. And five, tackle climate change by joining Schools Under 2C. Uh, in case you didn't know, Schools Under 2C is a student-run organization started in Tesla STEM High School. Their mission is to meet the standards of the Paris Climate Accord by reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and to encourage and help other schools do the same. Just recently, the Vice President of Schools Under 2C, Ryan Krishnan, was invited to the Seattle Youth Climate Action Summit to speak on behalf of his organization about what Schools Under 2C does. We're also working to align our aims with and expand on those of the city and school board. Now for some details on the kickoff. The kickoff was held after school on October 18th. It was a three hour event. This was the first time we invited and had Dan Fallon and PTSA representation in attendance. We also had representation from LWSG's resource conservation manager. Jed Reynolds was extremely helpful in debriefing emerging green teams on resources available to them. We had 34 students in attendance which is similar to the 33 from last year. Four out of the 10 middle schools and five out of the eight high schools were represented. The outcome of the kickoff was that students were successful in using our resources to make a work plan for the year. We place a high value on using work plans to benchmark current conditions, plan action steps, evaluate results, and communicate to stakeholders. Students who, end, who attended the kickoff really appreciated the guidance in developing the professional capacity and productivity of their own green teams. This kickoff was the start of collaboration between the ASB and the PTSA. 
We will definitely be organizing this event in the future with the goal of increasing participation to have a larger community impact. We strongly encourage the district to continue supporting our endeavor to make each school sustainable. Our upcoming Community Sustainability Summit will take place sometime in June. The purpose of the Community Sustainability Summit is to report the actual data-driven progress that we commit to achieving during the school year across generations and jurisdictions. We invite the school district and city to report to us just as we report to you. We hope you can join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, typically we don't treat public comment as a time for interaction with our audience. Uh, it's possible for us to make an exception for students. Anybody have any questions for the kids? So uh, in June, uh, make sure that you get information to Diane. Um, sure. And she'll distribute it to us on when that's happening. Okay. Um, and uh, even before then, feel free to send suggestions about what the district might be able to do. Of course. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. So, uh, do we have anybody else who didn't sign up who wishes to make public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll close that. And that brings us to the consent agenda. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Director uh, Bliesner, seconded by Director of Liberty. Uh, Dr. Pierce, would you please pull the board? Cassandra? Yes. Eric? Yes. Chris? Yes. Mark? Yes. Siri? Yes. All right, and per our standards, uh, Dr. will you please review our donations? I am happy to. Tab 4 has all of our donations this evening. Again, these are donations that the board accepts, um, which exceed $1,000. And we have a big list this evening, so I'll get right to it. A $3,000 donation from Lake Washington Schools Foundation to Wilder Elementary to provide before and after school math instruction. $3,500 from community school parent teacher group to community school to provide field trip bus transportation. $13,898 from Emily Dickinson, PTSA to Dickinson Elementary to provide stipends for choir, ASB, math club, outdoor ed, and extracurricular activities. $2,500 from Todd Ebert to Dickinson Elementary to support extracurricular activities. $34,973 from Albert Einstein PTSA to Einstein Elementary to purchase uh, mobile access devices for students. $2,200 from Ben Franklin PTA to Franklin Elementary to purchase Dreambox Learning, which is a math supplemental enrichment program. $35,765 from Krista McAuliffe, PTSA to McAuliffe Elementary to provide stipends for ASB field trip, choir, outdoor education, to purchase copy supplies and maintenance and classroom supplies, also for IXL and Accelerated Reader, and to support field trips. $8,335 from Margaret Mead, Elementary, PTSA to Mead Elementary to purchase Star Reading and Accelerated Reader subscriptions as well as Dreambox Learning. $15,150 from Redmond Elementary, PTSA to Redmond Elementary to purchase IXL Math, Accelerated Reader, and to support classroom enrichment. $12,831 from Ben Rush, PTA to Rush Elementary to provide a stipend for choir, also for IXL, and to support classroom enrichment. $5,400 from Inglewood Middle School PTSA to Inglewood Middle to provide a stipend for homework club. $5,041 from Kirkland Middle School PTSA to Kirkland Middle to provide stipends for homework clubs. $8,766 from Redmond Middle School PTSA to Redmond Middle to purchase classroom supplies and to support extracurricular activities. $2,500 from an anonymous donor to Rose Hill Middle School to support field trips. $38,750 $50 from Eastlake High School PTSA to Eastlake High School for classroom enrichment, classroom supplies, security camera, extracurricular activities, and drug and alcohol prevention intervention. $1,221 from Juanita High School Boosters Club to Juanita High School uh, to purchase sports uniforms, and $2,324 from Redmond High School Dance Team Booster to Redmond High School to provide a stipend for the dance team. So long list this evening of donations, all totaling $196,154, rounding to the nearest dollar. <laughs> so very appreciative of all the uh, varying donations from all the various sources. Yes, as always, we'd like to 
thank all of the groups and individuals who have chosen to support our students in schools. Uh, we and the children greatly appreciate your generosity. So uh, first item on the non-consent agenda is the 2018 legislative platform. Great, so if you could turn to tab five, uh, the situation to present is that uh, beginning uh, for the first time, it was in November 2014, the board adopted a legislative platform formally that addressed district priorities and positions on key legislative issues. And this legislative platform has been updated each year since, and uh, that update happens through a collaborative process involving board members, uh, myself, and staff. And this year, Siri, Mark, uh, and I, uh, as long, uh, excuse me, as well as posthumous, uh, met and we reviewed last year's legislative uh, platform. We reviewed uh, WASDA, WASA, all, all the alphabets, AWSP, WEA, uh, <laughs> um, all, PTA, yes. We looked at varying other uh, organizations' legislative platforms and uh, made some updates. So a copy uh, is here in your folder uh, for the board tonight, and the recommendation is for the board to approve the 2018 legislative platform. So with that, um, you've got a copy of the platform in front of you. Siri? I move to approve the legislative platform. Second. Great. Uh, the platform is now open for discussion. Not a lot of discussion I mean, on my part. Uh, it, it, a lot of it looks familiar, and yes, so some of these are the, I mean, things like updating the construction formula from the 1979 standards for state assistance. It's been, it's time. Well, and there's been movement on it. Yeah. So, okay. but it just hasn't quite hasn't gotten there. made it as far as it can go, so we can continue Glacial. doing it. Glacial. <laughs> yeah. Um, but each one has sort of been updated in regards to sort of McCleary yeah. and the impacts with that. So the Ampli funding really is sort of speaking to, we recognize what has occurred mm -hmm. and that's great. We're still missing in, in areas of special education, highly capable ELL. So it's really trying to target specifically to what can get impacted in this legislative session. I, I, just, I'd like, I appreciate the rationale that uh, people who took time putting this together. Mm -hmm. uh, the rationale for each of these is compelling, and um, I think you'd be a fool to read these and not agree with them. <laughs> and I also say that I really appreciate the Protect Community Voice in Education. I think that's very important, and we don't necessarily hear a lot about that. It's a perennial so challenge. Um, yeah, and the with, with regard to... Um, to the McCleary decision, it, it's it's sort of being implemented in parts, so it's not over by any stretch of the imagination. Therefore, these components are still on the table for discussion. Is that well, we felt it was important really to address the points that they haven't come through yet on. Yeah. The idea that they've done a good job to one degree, mm -hmm. but let's not stop there. Yeah. Because there are students that still need not their done. assistance and deserve it. Yes. As part of basic education. Okay. I have no other questions. Anyone else? Again, thank you guys. Um, this is a, a, a this 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 makes me very happy. It's it's concise. It's one page. I I, I it fits my attention span. So um, the one piece I would like on it is that we have a white paper that goes with those. So yeah. there will be talking points as to what sort yeah. of is our data behind that that we speak to, so that we have very clear how these things are important in Lake Washington matter. School District, yeah. and we can speak to that very clearly. Fantastic. All right, um, so do we have to, uh, do we have to, we don't have to, do we have to vote on it? We do, okay. Sorry, I lost my place in the, okay. Uh, there's a motion on the table, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Hearing none opposed, uh, motion passes. So we have a 2018 legislative platform. Um, this is a, a short session, or is this a long session? I, I'm sorry, I, this is the short, short one. Okay, so it'll be until they extend it. <laughs> legislative yeah. assembly is the end of our legislative day, yeah. end of January. Okay. So please attend. All right, uh, and let's see. Our second item is approval of the monitoring report on math. 
Great, so uh, tab six, so this is a follow-up from the math presentation which was uh, done at the November 6th meeting and at the subsequent meeting, we didn't have the approval of the assertion of progress and exceptions form on the non-consent agenda. So now we have uh, kind of redone that, placed it on the non-consent agenda. The uh, assertion of progress and exceptions form is here in your folder. Um, this is the form that the board collaboratively, Chris took the lead this time on mathematics based on input from the entire board and completed the form. And so the recommendation tonight is for the board to approve the monitoring report and the assertion of progress and exceptions form for ER 23 mathematics as presented. So um, before we discuss, I'll hear a motion to approve. I so moved. Great. Second. Moved, moved by Director Liberty, seconded by Director Bleasner. Okay, um, so part of this, we're still working our way through how to do this. Um, <laughs> you're very funny, Mark. <laughs> yes, I think the math report does add up, but uh, the, the, the bigger picture piece of this is how, well, actually, first we'll talk about the math report, and then we'll get into the, the structure around the, the reports. Um, the goal is to provide not just a, yes, we think, but, you know, here's where we really do agree that focus should be placed or emphasis should be placed over the coming year um, with regard to the report that we were given uh, in person. So um, any questions or comments around the current text that's in there? I had sent some comments prior. I don't know if those were ever incorporated uh, in. My if you sent them to not. me, they haven't been incorporated okay. in um, simply because I didn't forward an update on this. Um, and so um, for the for the purpose of uh, a, a, a useful example, what were the comments? The biggies. The, the, I, I will. Yeah, you'll find them. The big. Yeah. Um, at the end, when you deal with the feedback and indicators, so when we yep. sort of speak to that component, um, there were a few places that I would like us to consider new indicators because we're missing information in which to be able to make um, solid evaluation of what's going on. Um, one of those I would say is missing algebra um, and algebra completion, um, either by ninth grade or eighth grade, one of the two. There we go. Um, so that we can look as that's a foundational math and that's sort of a key step going forward. Mm -hmm. The other is the long term, which is the um, remedial in college. What's the need in which to take a remedial course? Um, for math, and so that's sort of a long-term piece to be able to look at as to how it plays out that way. So that's sort of some of the pieces that I'd like to consider those new indicators. Um, they wouldn't go on this time, it'd be for the next time around, but as a piece to look at. So for long-term remediation, that has been a part of something we get from the state, but is that something we get annually? Typically we provide uh, college remediation rates as part of ER1, uh, so we can, I am just trying to remember if we get the data presented by content area in addition to math and English, if we get science, we likely do. I just have to go back and look. Uh, so mm -hmm. we, we will present uh, the remediation rate data that we do have as part of ER1. We could certainly also include that in yeah. you know the content area reports. In terms of process, what we had discussed is uh, and so we'll have to capture that somewhere here that on an annual basis in terms of setting the key performance indicators for each end result that the board would review that in uh, extended study session in March and so then any updates to key performance indicators would uh, be reflected in our policy and then moved forward for the next year. So that'd be great. Just another note, there are some things that we've, like you'll see tonight in the science report, there were some, there's some pre presentation modifications that we're able to do, um, just in terms of how we're presenting the data, take some of that yeah. feedback in terms of number size and those kind of things and incorporate that into tonight's presentation. So those little modifications we try to do kind of ongoing right. along the way, but the bigger things like shifting of or adding an indicator yep. would come in for the following year. Yeah which I think is quite reasonable. Um, the other piece was um, pre-K. 
and looking at that component that wasn't listed in here so my concern was wasn't exposed to I do see that yeah. as being a a focus area to think about as to what is our approach um, especially with the keys that um, King County will now have education dollars that there's about 300 million and I'm not sure how it's going to work out but they will that they have to prioritize to education um, so this is a possibility that early learning is one of those components that they might be looking at. So it's something to be thinking about how do we start to partner and really address the early learning piece because it's coming clear in our data in different ways that that's coming through. Um, so that would be a piece I'd like to see and there is a focus priority. Um, also, we were missing a focus around looking at other school districts, especially for low income, that are above us in our rankings. We had spoken to that. So. Um, how do we build that piece in? That was the one piece that jumped at all of us at the presentation I remembered. Yeah, so I, I managed to capture the discussion around low income, but not the piece around, there are some of the districts that are comparisons. It, it wasn't our usual suspects who were beating us in the low income area. That's an interesting opportunity. Um, so was it sort of an explore this concept and be able to see what we can do with that? Um, and I also had a general question that it can, it can actually be brought up tonight, is on the school improvement plans. Those are being listed as a current strategy that's being utilized. And from what my, from my memory, these are every year and they're do a one year school improvement plan. And if this is one of the main mechanisms that's being utilized in which to really address some of the outcomes or is a mechanism, it doesn't appear to be impacting the trends as effectively as we might have hoped. So is there a way to utilize that system more effectively in which to make, so is it longer ver longer range? They do three to five year plan. Is it, you know, is there some way to build that stronger into the outcomes um, to impact those more holistically? Because these gaps we're finding will take time and will take mm -hmm. effort that's pretty extensive to move those effectively. So I guess that was one of my pieces I was looking at from a big picture, how to use a system that's already there and strengthen what we have to make it work better from a continuous quality improvement. So those are kind of my big things. I have smaller little detail things that are yeah. delete this line. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, those, I figure those edits can be done, but I, I have no concern with any of those. Those are reasonable things where calling them out more explicitly is fine. Um. So I, I guess, sorry, Siri, I'm, or Siri and Chris, my question is, I guess for the board, so, so these comments that Siri has made that are so not is, reflected in what- The, it, the actual text isn't there yet. So um, I suppose- And we're trying Siri, to figure out how to do it. Well, <laughs> can we move amending it um, to reflect the written text to reflect Siri's so comments now? <laughs> yeah. Any concerns? No. Okay. Hearing that. So I, I mean, I would that's agree. That's good. Just to yeah. I, I, mean, up, I would agree that it, that should be added. In, that should be in the uh, memorialized. Yes. I, I think that's great. The only problem is I'm terrible at doing that piece of synthesis. Um, so if you've already got them, I assume you've got a marked up version that yes. we can just adopt. Yeah. So. <laughs> We'll distribute this marked up version conditioned on that. And I, so, okay, in the bigger picture, so this is, we're still muddling through yeah. as this is the second time we've done this. The, the question is, are, how, how are we going to approach the, how do we build this? Um, the utility of it, it really is coming back and talking through, okay, what are the big themes that we find really important in the data where we'd like to emphasize those. And one of the things where we're like, yes, we, we, we bless that assertion of progress. Um, so it, it's getting both of those pieces into our report back to the administration. Um, and so one of the, what was the, the mechanism that you were talking about down in, um, was it Federal Way, where there's actually a quick, thing that everybody fills in with Survey Monkey, I don't know, but where there, there are short responses from each of them, but then there's going to be somebody who's responsible for taking on synthesis of the comments from the board members, finding common themes and then finding themes that might be idiosyncratic, but nonetheless acknowledging things that people think are important in the draft report. 
so basically it's that first step of everybody provides modest amounts of feedback. Mm -hmm. Then somebody sits down and synthesizes a first draft out of it. And then we would bring it back in such a way that hopefully the person who synthesizes it distributes it with enough time before the next meeting for us to read through and actually come back and talk it through. So the idea isn't so much that it goes into the consent agenda. It's, it's making sure that everybody feels that they can sign off on this version is, is the goal of this. Sure. Um, so we're, we're, like I said, we're inventing as we go, but I think it's a, we're, or rather we're, 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 we're plagiarizing an effective model piece by piece and finding out how well it works well for us because I love imitating something rather than inventing it when you don't have to. Um, so that's hopefully what we'll be doing in our next round. And on science, I, I think I volunteered to do this one too. <laughs> I might need a little bit of help putting together the survey monkey, and this might take a little bit longer than it, hopefully we'll get this down to that model. But anyway, um, for the moment we won't necessarily have a survey monkey, but if each, if each of you can just send me an email that has, you know, Siri never has any problem expressing all of the things she finds important, but certainly call out the three things that are most important to you in the presentation from this evening, and I'll synthesize those, um, try to get a first draft together, and get it back out to you with, so that we've got a week to read, think, and then come back and talk about it. I will give you all the input a journalist major should make on science. <laughs> <laughs> Siri, do you have an There's example from the Federal Way School District? No, I don't have a written one, actually, but I'm meeting with them on Thursday, so it's, okay. I can ask them to bring it. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly what does their survey monkey thing look like? I mean, that would be great. Basically, I think it's this. It's just an open, they just have three questions that they put out, and this would be the same thing, would say reasonable progress, evidence, so what are your sort of takeaways on that? What are the strengths and challenges? What do you see as the focus priority areas? Yeah. Going, and then that's the whole piece of then you start to be able to have that discussion and, and sort of target it. So anyway, a mini version. You don't have to put together the, the whole shebang. But really, if, if something's important to you, do make sure it's in that email. OK? To ask my son, who is an applied mathematics and computer science major, what he thinks You're it should look like. To ask him what it should look like. But I hate to say that those applied math majors are almost as bad as the theoretical mathematicians. Um, I'm sorry, high school math isn't necessarily applied math in well, it should be applied math, but it's different than their applied math. What, it, what so. I would say is part of the key is going back and looking at what were, the, what were we saying we were trying to evaluate yeah. in the sense, and, and that's for science or math. So we do have that stated at the beginning. What were the targets we were putting forward that we wanted to be able to look at? And then what are the indicators we're utilizing? And then how well is this meeting those goals? And, and, um, and then speaking to those, so where it's, where it's working. And, there could be like, continue doing that. That's fabulous. It seems to be doing what it really needs to do or expand it or explore, right? You know, yeah. you're moving well this way. We think that effort should continue with, with focus. And there are certainly two dimensions, at the very least, two distinct layers to this. First is, are you seeing the data that you think you need? I mean, that's something where just asking about the presentation or are you seeing it in a format that's useful? If you can see some other way that's more useful to you, let's call it out because we can work with the administration to improve how it's communicated to us. Um, and they've gotten better every year I've been on the board, um, but um, as with any presentation, it's always got room for improvement. Um, but the next layer is really getting into the guts of policy governance. How are we doing? Do we buy the assertions of e the, the evidence, um, the assertions of progress, and what, you know, what does the board not only think of performance to date, but where do we really want to see the needle move in the near future? So, all right. Um, so any other questions on this? For the moment, I would, since I abjectly failed to circulate series marked up version of it, I'm going to uh, uh, propose that Siri distributes that and we put it in the consent agenda next time. Right, I think there's a, yeah, I was gonna say there's a, Motion pending. Which uh, is well, to so I guess we, it. we we could approve that. Yeah. Um, You're advocating not to. Well, I'm, I'm just. Well, I'm actually okay so we with. Actually it. Read what we're approving. It's probably Sage. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it's not that I don't trust her. I mean, the fact is, I've read it. I'm good with approving it on site on scene. Yeah. But um, uh, that's what I'm going to propose as a. 
Okay. Which well, Chris is how they got their I just can't remember how to turn off a motion on the floor. Well, just, we can I amend. Yeah. Okay. So I'd move tabling the existing motion. I'll second that. Okay. Um, allowing us to just approach this as Siri can circulate it. If we have any concerns, yeah. we can resolve it by email. We don't need to do any further public conversation around it, and we'll put it into the consent agenda next cycle. So if I'm following, go ahead and make the edit and mark up in that fashion. I have comments at this point in exactly. time. I did not edit. Yeah, um, no. It, but you're asking that I I'm actually just edit saying, it and just then send it. it that way. Make okay. it happen. It, it, because I, I believe you'll do a better job of capturing what you mean than I will. Okay. Um, <laughs> so. The goal is to capture what the board means. Yes. So that is my, and I'm, my purpose. Uh, yes. That's good. Okay. We need so. to vote on tabling the motion. Oh. Robert's rules. Man. I know, I know. I really should have read it at some point. All right. So all those in favor of, oh, we need a second. I, didn't I get a second? Yeah, Mark did. Mark seconded it. Yep. Okay. All those in favor of tabling? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Um, so uh, it's tabled. Yeah, and then I will move that we, uh, after it's circulated, that this go on the consent agenda for next meeting. Do I have a second? Second. second. Okay, moved by Director Liberty, seconded by Director Sage. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those against? Hearing none, motion carries. Yay. <laughs> I know, I know. Thank God we've got someone who knows how to do this stuff. Um, all right. So our uh, our final item on the non-consent agenda is monitoring report for the board policy on science. Great. So uh, Mike Van Orden is making his way uh, to the podium. And while Mike's bringing up the presentation, I do also just want to remind the board that you have the, the written monitoring report in uh, your notebook, tab 7. And so we don't necessarily incorporate all of this into the PowerPoint version, but um, the written report does have what are the established uh, key performance indicators for science. So these are the ones that the board agreed upon uh, in March as we revised our ER reporting structure. And then um, the, sort of the, the larger overall targets, remember, are threefold, that we're looking for 95% of our students to meet all established indicators. So we've got the, the indicators and then the targets. So I should be clearer. There, we agreed on the indicators and the targets. So the targets, threefold. 95% of students meeting all established indicators. The student performance is comparable to student performance in comparable Washington State districts, which we've defined to date as districts over 6,500, and that student performance is improving. So those are the three big things that we are looking at, and if you remember, part of the conversation was, although we only have, and you can see from your written report, um, certain areas uh, of indicators where students are meeting that 95 target, we're looking at all three of those together, and all three of those together are what's informing whether reasonable progress is being made, and that really is, a uh, discussion point and decision amongst the board based on how close are we to the 95% uh, our students to the 95% how much progress is being made and what how are we doing when compared to other districts so that's those are the three things and just for the benefit of anyone who's watching who doesn't have the written report in front of them that's kind of the construct around our ER report so tonight's about science we're uh, going to lead with a little just reminder about uh, what our science program is and uh, then we'll get into the actual data of the of the monitoring report. So Michael, have you just go ahead um, to the standards um, here in terms of what are our science programs. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then we'll get into the actual assertion of progress. All right, well thanks for the opportunity to share our uh progress in science. Um, as always, we like to give you an overview of our science program, say about some context for the data that you'll see a little bit later. Uh, so elementary school, uh, as we mentioned last year, we have um, 120 minutes to 150 mi minutes per week of science instruction using um, curriculum 
that is um, in a kit-based form. And as a reminder, we are in the process right now of aligning or updating our curriculum through a curriculum adoption process um, to make that curriculum align with the new state standards. And so that's something else to know for the entire um, science program K-12 is we have new state science standards, a new state of science assessment that's coming online this year and will be a graduation requirement for the class of 2021. So unlike math and ELA, there's a little bit of misalignment between what we're going to be assessing from this point on and what the uh, indicators you're gonna see tonight are. And then also for our secondary curriculum, there's a little bit of a misalignment. We have curriculum that's aligned to the new standards, but we're still assessing under the old. So just keep that in mind as we're going through the presentation tonight. Um, at middle school, as you recall, we um, adopted curriculum um, in 2016 that was aligned to the next gen science standards. Um, it's a six, seven, eight curriculum that incorporates physical earth and life science standards and that's really, again, tightly aligned with the new state assessment that we'll see this year. And then in high school, uh, the year before that, we adopted curriculum for um, our core classes that most of our students take, which are biology, chemistry, physics, and uh, physical science with earth. And so again, that curriculum's aligned with the new state standards that will come online this year. So that's our overall science program. Um, what we wanna do now again is look at um, performance indicators. And again, knowing these are um, performance indicators aligned to the older state standards, there'll be new ones coming online. So overall, as we look at how our students are doing, even with new curriculum at the secondary level that's matched up to the new standards, um, we would make an assertion that our, we're making reasonable progress overall, um, but we do, as in ELA and math, have exceptions um, based on specific student groups, and um, those are uh, ELL, special education, and um, some of our minority groups. Um, and then we also have uh, no grade level that's really yet met that 95% at or above target in science, though we are meeting that for credit requirements. So going with that assertion, uh, we're performing um, in fifth and eighth grade in the top two um, of school dist or largest districts in the state. Um, biology, EOC, we're in that top tier as well. And remember, not um, that was a graduation requirement that's no longer a graduation requirement, but it's, um, it's still we're up there in the top districts. Um, and as with the other areas, we have more students earning full science credit. And so that's um, a reflection, remember, of the courses that we offer being more than an on-demand assessment, but incorporating a lot of different elements, um, both in terms of content, knowledge, and skills. And so we are seeing, over time, more students in all of our groups earning more credit in science, which is a good thing. We're, they're on track for graduation. So now we talk about exceptions by the groups that we mentioned, um, starting with special education. As uh, in our other areas, we see we're in that six to 12 uh, ranked um, for our districts in each of the grade levels, so grade five, eight, and 10. Uh, we are seeing that uh, particularly in grade five and eight, a little bit lower, but in uh, grade 10, we're kind of in that top tier. At the same time, we do see performance gaps for our, our students who have um, IEPs. And remember, IEPs um, and special education um, are related to 13 different qualifying categories. Science is not one of those. And so that's something to keep in mind. And um, I think the board has expressed interest in thinking about um, how different groups of students that have IEPs might be performing. But again, this is all students with IEPs um, that take this the assessments, and so again, we see gaps in, in all grade levels, five, eight, and 10, and we also see gaps um, for our cohort group for the class of 2019. Um, so over time, even though that gap is closing somewhat, there's still a, a significant gap there. Um, and as I mentioned, the class of 2019, we have a, a gap over time. Uh, we had a little dip in eighth grade, and so even though there's a slight performance increase from 63 to 69% over time for that group, um, there's a 28% gap. We also think that that uptick in grade 10 is partly a, re a reflection of the um, fact the assessment's a graduation requirement. Kids take it a little bit more seriously. So we do, in most of our groups, see a slight uptick um, from grade eight to grade 10 because kids are thinking, I need this for graduation. So in science, when we think about our approach, um, particularly as we transition to new standards, uh, 
Whereas in ELA and math, we had these very targeted specific interventions. What we're looking at right now for science is to make sure that every kid really has access to core science instruction. And so that's a function of the amount of time they spend in science, whether they're being pulled out in elementary for other areas, whether uh, they're getting access to uh, general education and special education science classes. And so, or getting access to general education if they're in special education. So that's kind of our primary approach in uh, special education is, is there access to that core science instruction? Um, at the same time, we're looking at, we'll probably have a need in the coming years as we get the data around the new science assessment to say, what are we gonna do for kids who are falling behind or who are struggling with science concepts? Some of that comes through things like our credit recovery at the secondary level, but also looking at um, earlier grades, how do we go in and intervene when a kid needs some help? And sometimes that might be a function of their science knowledge, but sometimes it's a function, particularly in the younger years, of their reading ability, vocabulary, uh, access to a range of experiences in science. And so as we look at kind of a multi-tiered system of supports that we're working on as a district, science should fit within that framework. The other thing that we'll be thinking about for elementary in particular is as we adopt new science curriculum, how does it have more than just the straight science? How does it give kids lots of opportunities, not only in science, but in technology, engineering, and math? So we're getting that STEM experience and enriching um, opportunities for kids that might not have had those in their lifetime. Uh, so we're looking at building that into the curriculum as well as during the school day. Um, again, that's all kind of that basic core tiered instruction with some additional support um, through our MTSS. Next, we look at English language learners. Um, again, performing in the top tier of uh, districts in the state. Remember, there's a whole series of um, districts underneath this, so this is, uh, doesn't reflect all 49, we're, so we're ranked up in the top in grades five, eight, and 10. Um, as, but as we've said in our other presentations, we do see gaps. Um, however, with students who have exited the program, they are performing um, close to or um, just a little bit below um, their peers who have not been in the ELL program. So. Unlike uh, math and ELA, uh, where we in fact had some places where our exited ELL students were outperforming, the case here is there are still gaps, though they're not as big. Um, and then pretty significant gaps for students who are still in the program. And again, that would make sense. Science is a very language dependent um, uh, subject, and so students need to have mastery of the language to succeed. And so part of our efforts, as we'll share with you in a little bit, is to how do we build that um, in over time. And again, we see um, gaps with our cohort group, though again, it's, it's improving slightly, most likely a function that eighth to 10th grade uptick is most likely a function of it being a graduation requirement. So as I was mentioning, uh, one of our main efforts around science to close the gap is going to be building that vocabulary, academic vocabulary through a process we call PSYOP um, that will be training that our teachers will be receiving over the next few years. Um, and again, that core curriculum, our new elementary adoption should focus on providing access to a broad range of students. Um, our curricula that we've looked at in the past for secondary has had strategies and resources for ELL students, and so that will be one of the requirements that our committee looks at here as well. Uh, we also look at how do we connect with existing resources in our system, so for example, um, some of our natural leader programs in our title schools offer STEM family nights to connect um, families and build interest, and so we'll look at how do we do that through family connections as well as our curriculum. And then uh, we'll be working with our teachers to make sure that they're skilled in delivering instruction to a range of students as we, um, we not only adopt new curriculum in elementary, but as we continue to provide training and support to secondary science teachers. For our low-income students, as you were mentioning earlier, uh, the performance here drops a little bit compared to uh, other districts and compared to other subgroups. And so, as you were mentioning before, there's probably some things to learn from other districts. And at the same time, I, as I mentioned, there's gonna be a, a gap of a few years. We wanna see how these same districts do next year on the new assessment. Uh, my sense is there'll be some shuffling as a result of the, the very different structure of the new assessment and the new standards. Um, so I would, I'd be a little bit hesitant right now to jump out and contact all of these schools knowing that their scores could change pretty radically next year. Um, as, as in the other um, subject areas, the other groups, we do see gaps here as well. Um, so we are finding that um, the language isn't a, a function here and the gaps aren't as significant as they are, for example, in ELL, there's still um, anywhere from 20 to 30 points um, 
for, for many of our groups of students and grade levels. And the cohort group, um, again, even though it looks a little bit better, that's still a, a pretty significant gap um, for students. Again, that uptick from eighth to 10th grade, but again, that's 25% of our students who are low income who aren't meeting that graduation requirement. We'll wanna see what that will look like with the new assessment, but that's something we need to make sure we're attending to. So as I mentioned before, um, core curriculum, then we also think about, um, here's a place where early learning does um, support many of our low income students and in our preschool program, science actually. We mentioned this I think at the um, program review report at the beginning of the year, that there is science instruction as early as preschool and that it continues all the way through K-12 and so building those foundational concepts is something we can be thinking about. Um, and then also attending to those other needs that students from low-income households have. Um, and that's everything from um, just kind of the social-emotional to the family support that gives the kid the security and the um, ability to attend to school when they're here. And so um, our McKinney-Vento liaison working with families is an important function, even though that doesn't directly tie one-to-one -to, -one to science, it's an important function for kids' success in school. And finally, uh, race and ethnicity. And so here, um, again, we see that students are performing in the top tier. We also put in our N values. Uh, I think there was a question about that for, from the last, um, the last meeting. And just for clarity for yes. everyone, N refers to the number of students. Mm -hmm, at each of those grades, so 43 yeah. African-American mm -hmm. fifth grade students. And um, so you can see here the number jumps for Hispanic students, so more Hispanic students. Uh, and again, performing in the top tier. Those, um, those numbers are for all um, Hispanic students, uh, whether they're in ELL program or not ELL program. We know many of our Hispanic students um, are in ELL programs, and uh, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit here as well. Um, we do have gaps, and so there was an interest in teasing out even more at a greater depth than this. So um, again, the idea here is there are gaps, persistent achievement gaps by race for every, um, for each of the subgroups we mentioned. And that also holds true for cohort data, or for our cohort groups. What we did next, though, is we started to dig deeper into this. And so I think this is where you're, you'll uh, be most interested. And this is what Tracy was saying about um, it being data that's in the presentation, but not in the report. Right, so one of the, based on the dialogue uh, the board had with respect to math and understanding, especially as we're looking at race and the achievement of students, where how does income factor into the data, um, how does language factor into the data. So this time around, this is a display that you haven't seen in previous reports. We built a, a little bit of a different look at, uh, at groups of students um, in terms of race and income specifically. So that's what this is, and I'll have Matt, Mike uh, walk you through how to read it. Um, so. A little bit to unpack here. One of the things I think that's always uh, important, and we've heard this before, is a percentage gives you one piece of information, but it's important to know the number of students that lie within that percentage. Um, so for example, if we look at our Asian students in grade eight, and we're just looking at grade eight data as, as an example. So um, you see similar patterns in grade five and 10. Um, and we, we did this today, so that's partly why you're not seeing grade five and 10. Um, so for grade eight data, we have 429 students. We, that met standard. I'm sorry, grade eight for Asian students. I'm going to back you up we're just yep. real quick since it follows the same pattern. Mm -hmm. When we look at the total number, so we're looking at eighth grade students, the total number of Asian students, it's 474. And then of that number, we unpacked percentage meeting standard, not meeting standard, and income within each of those groups. Correct. So of the 474, 429 Asian students met standard. 45 did not, and then we broke it down further uh, by income, um, and our low income and non-low income. So for Asian students, 85% of the students who met standard uh, were non-low income, and 24 or 5% of the students who met standard were low income. Um, and then again, you see over here, of the 45 students who did not meet standard, 34 were low income and 11, or were non-low income and 11 were low income. So it's interesting, you do start to see some patterns here uh, that when you look at students who did not meet standard, um, particularly if we look at a larger sample size here for Hispanic students, you get this interesting ratio. And I, this is something that stood out to me as I was looking at it today. Um, if you look at just the number of kids, so here we have 1,200 kids, and here we have 200, so 
about a factor of six greater, but only twice as many, or almost twice as many students that didn't meet standard from the low-income group. So there's a discrepancy, that's a gap, that's something interesting to look at. Um, even for um, black African-American, 12 students that were low-income didn't meet standard, and again, if you look here, that's about the same number of Asian students and a much, a much greater number overall. So we start, we start to see some specific mm -hmm. patterns and trends in here um, that just beg some questions and, and make us start to think, is um, race part of a function of how our students are performing, as well as income? We because, all know. Yeah, the that other part, just to interject here, is we don't, we're not just looking at the makeup of the students who did not meet standard, right. but also the makeup of the students who did meet standard. So it's just interesting for us, again, it, as Mike was about to um, to say how does income factor in and how does race factor in? And it's, it, there are, we're seeing both of those factors being factors. And again, it's not about the students, it's about the system. What this data helps us reflect it on is as a system, are there things that we're doing or not doing that are contributing to what we're seeing? not what the students can or can't do, because we know all students can. And we have students that are succeeding that you would maybe predict wouldn't. So that, that's information that gives us direction, not to say that we have kids who are deficient, but what are the things we need to change about our approach, whether that's through intervention, curriculum, um, interactions with kids and families, um, the way we deliver instruction, all of those are areas that we want to be thinking about, as well as all of the things we talked about earlier tonight. Um, we started, and it just got to be five o'clock and time to run down, we started to break this down even further by language, um, to say students who were never ELL and actually ELL, um, just as a general trend, what we do see, as you would predict, is if you were at one point ELL, uh, that you might start a little bit lower. But uh, students who were never ELL, so for example, Hispanic students that were never ELL perform at a higher level than those who were, and so we know language um, students who are learning English as a second language um, takes longer time, but also students who are Hispanic who were never second language, English has always been their first language, perform at a much higher rate than those who weren't, if that, make, if that makes sense. So we're, we'll start digging down into that at a much deeper level um, for all of our areas and all of our grade levels. So here again, we're looking at um, access to core instruction. We're also thinking about um, culturally relevant curriculum and instruction. And so if we do um, go with that assumption that yes, income, yes, all of these other factors influence how students succeed at school, but also race is a factor in there, then we need to be thinking about um, how we address and relate to kids and how our curriculum and our instruction and our approaches relate to kids. Um, and then also, again, making sure that all of our kids have access to high quality instruction and are prepared to access high quality instruction. So again, overall, um, we do see high performance, in, especially in relation to other districts when we look at all of our students, but as we start to break it down, as with the LA and math, we do see um, gaps and, and um, areas of improvement that are needed, and we are still working on that 95% target, and remember, that will be something we'll need to recalibrate next year with a new assessment. I'm just gonna add one thing that I am kind of noticing on our overall, if you go back to the slide you were just on, uh, what we, we have called out one of the performance targets now based on board feedback in terms of how do we have any groups meeting the 95. Um, and we haven't really called out on here the other two targets in terms of how many of the indicators, how many groups do we have that are growing? So do we have student performances improving? And um, where are we, you know, comparable in at least, you know, especially kind of if we're in the top three districts in terms of performance in the state or something. We have that not on here, but it is found on the color-coded um, sheet in the written report. So uh, while we, well, we don't have, for example, just to call it out, any groups meeting the 95% on the state assessment. When we look at the all student group for fifth grade, they're at 86.7% and we're rank two. Um, or for eighth grade science, we're 86%, we're rank two, and it's a 3.2% growth. So I just share that just because I think it's uh, 
Um, there's a part of the, what gets shared in the presentation. Um, there's a piece of the picture that we haven't, and we might want to think about moving forward. It's just occurring to me now. Um, you know, kind of starting with the color-coded key. So uh, we're looking at all of those, those um, targets, if that's making sense anyway. It's just a reflection. The other thing is just in terms of prog uh, process, again, for everybody's benefit, uh, how we're trying to structure this is we give the presentation, and then this part now is time for board um, observation, individual board member comments. If you have a clarifying question, I think we'll try to answer the question. If it's more of a rhetorical question or a, I wonder, we'll just capture it and we won't try to get into the dialogue of it because, again, since this is individual board member, comments. We won't get into all of that. We'll just let the board talk. We'll capture it. Diane is capturing what the board members are saying. Then those individual board member comments go to Chris this time. And then Chris will synthesize and uh, do what he's going to do for the assertion in progress reporting form that will come back at the next meeting for uh, next steps. So just to say that, I think last time, we, we were reflecting last time, we were kind of getting into dialogue um, or trying to answer questions the board was posing during the individual board member comment piece. And what we should really be doing is saving that until the entire, until it's the, the board consensus of here's what we believe about the, you know, we would have that more at, um, at the following meeting, if I'm making sense, after it's reflective of the board consensus. But not to say we can't answer individual questions, it's just that we were kind of getting, it, we were doing maybe too much talking when it was time for board, board comments. So with that, I will stop talking and let the board make comments. Um, as with the math analysis, uh, if we can go back one slide to the strategies, We're very good at doing the what's, the numbers, the percentages, the gains, the losses, whatever. But I'm still not, I, I don't see, and I think we, to really move the needle, especially on the gap areas, we need to really dig into the whys, and we're not. And I think that's, no matter what kind of, if you have strategies to close the gaps and only based on the what's, and you don't look, address the whys, you're never going to close those gaps. I don't care what the topic is, whether it's science, education, math education, or immunization. I don't care. Doesn't matter. Point is, we've got to address the whys in here. And uh, one of the things I think we might want to look at that would help, especially and on a different plane here, as we're looking at curriculum adoption especially for the ELL students, and but maybe also the uh, low income, and for that matter, those of us who are science challenged. I think we also need to look at the science writing aspect, because I think as I've observed the various science classes that I've sat through at the high schools, uh, writing is really pushed to the side and that we have the English teachers who teach writing very well, we have science teachers who teach science very well, but never the twain shall meet. And that's perhaps where if you had more emphasis on ex being able to explain the concept as a student and being able to write about the concept, perhaps you might bridge some of those gaps, especially with the ELL students, because you'd be talking to them on a on more of a conversational level and to be quite frank, any student that isn't really a science as their top priority, I think that when you put it into context and you help them write about it, explain it, then it becomes real to them. Otherwise, they're just memorizing names, dots, figures, whatever. You see where I'm going? Um, so I, I, so I think I said similar things about math. I continue to be disappointed by performance with low-income students. Um, and I also, am, uh, like the math one, surprised by where we are relative to comparable districts um, with low-income students. 
and it's it's very interesting to me that again the, the districts that are above us like with the math uh, data are not districts that are usually uh, above us uh, but what is interesting is I was comparing the math report presentation with this and the districts that are above us there do seem to be some uh, camas for example in Mead uh, for both science and math um, so that that just telling me that they are something that they are doing that we could maybe learn from. Um, but, uh, and I lost my train of thought. I'll leave it at that for now. I might return, <laughs> my brain, when my brain comes back, I might have a few more comments, but um, I, I, do, I do appreciate the presentation. Again, I think it, it continues to be an excellent job of, of presenting where we have room to grow. And um, I, for me, I'd like to see us continue to focus on uh, performance for low-income students. Sorry, I'm gonna keep going because I just remember what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I would like to see, I know it's hard, you, we, we probably compile this, pres this presentation and this data right before, you know, days before, uh, at least the comparable data, maybe days before uh, the meeting. Uh, to the extent there is time to, as part of the report, reach out to these comparable districts to see what, if there is anything that can be learned from it in advance of the presentation, I would be, interested in having that be part of it. I don't know if um, administrate, if that's even, if that's possible, given the, the timeline that we have for preparing these and presenting to the board, but uh, if that's possible to add that to the presentation, I, I would be interested in knowing. That might explain the why. By uh, well, talking I, to them to see what know. they're doing it's differently. Sorry, I, I, you're looking at me askance. No, no, oh, okay. I, it could be something I could see that after the discussion has taken place, if that becomes a focus priority that we say, you know what, we think it would be really great to go explore here um, and learn more about what is happening in this. Prior might be a little difficult because there can be so many things that come up that where is that priority? And being able to provide that direction might be more beneficial. I agree, Siri. But I, just, I think it's a valuable point that, that we should be paying attention to what's happening. I just had a question about the natural leaders. Um, do we know how many natural leaders we have that are actually actively engaged in our Title I schools and assisting with some of these challenges? I know we've listed them as a resource and sometimes as a new strategy being implemented. But I also hear that um, it's difficult to get natural leaders, and I'm just not sure if each of our Title I schools has a very active natural leader space. Mm -hmm. Great question. So just for the benefit of everyone, uh, Natural Leaders is a program in our Title I schools. It's a program that we receive uh, funding for training from the Washington Alliance for Better Schools, which we're a member district of. And so how it works is uh, a leader in the community will be identified and that uh, individual receives training through WABS and then they help to serve sort of as a liaison to a, a specific community and help uh, engage parents um, and the school together. So it's about helping to um, ensure that students um, uh, underrepresented families have a voice in the education, feel welcome in the school, understand how the system works, and so forth. So to answer your question, we have, I can get the updated data on how many natural leaders um, are kind of active in each of our Title I schools. That can be a follow-up um, that we will get from, uh, from our schools. And then, um, we again, I'm sorry, just repeat. So it's you'd like to know the, the numbers of natural leaders and what was the other piece? Well, it would be nice to know how many natural leaders we have and how many building administrators feel how active they are. Because I know it's been a struggle to maintain um, some of those contacts that are very valuable to underrepresented families. Um, and I know there's a lot of need. So I just want to make sure we're not relying too much on a natural leader. Gotcha. Okay. And mm -hmm. certainly anything that we as a board can do to um, grow that program, I'd be happy to discuss. Great. 
so um, actually, Mike, uh, first, thank you. The, the subtle changes do matter. I really appreciate just a, a point of process here for the board. It just, it's, it, and I think it's really important from a That's policy fair. government standpoint. So I have staff help me um, present to you, but this dialogue really needs to be directed as to me as superintendent versus my team. That's, so if you have okay. uh, questions, comments, whatever, please direct them to me, and then. Um, be, okay. Yeah. That's really important. Thanks. Yeah, um, and so that's something where the I. I, I I do appreciate the changes that were the minor things that you could do on the fly. That's, that's huge. Um, but if you can take us back to slide 19. Um, in the data, there's, when we looked at math, one of the most interesting pieces of for me was the achievement gaps for ELL students, or rather the relative absence of them. Um, for former ELL, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And exited, so exited one, ELL. there we go. Mm -hmm. Ex it's, so on this slide, um, what I noticed was, you know, top left panel, you're looking at fifth grade, and ELL um, is, students who are currently in ELL are not doing as well as students who are out of ELL. But students who have exited ELL at fifth grade are performing absolutely comparably to students who were never in ELL. Right. Um, in eighth grade, there may have been a gap historically, but for the last, last three years, I'm quite happy to say that that's not a big, not something that concerns me. But then you pop up to grade 10, in the bottom left, mm -hmm. and that's where I'm. I'm real interested in understanding. This is the first case I've seen where students who've exited ELL at the time of the tenth grade test are performing significantly worse than students who were never in ELL. So the black line is about ten points lower than the red line mm -hmm. in the left bottom left panel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's consistent. I mean, this is a gap that's been there. I think it's. I mean, I think that it's very likely that the assertion can be made that language is much more important the further one goes in the system. But at the same time, it does beg the question for me of whether ELL is a different challenge with older students, whether they need additional supports beyond having been in ELL. Well, and, and I think um, I just I will comment on that because I think it's something that we have um, seen in previous reports as well that that uh, Although I'm just reflecting a little bit because it's typically what we see is the lower performance of the longer than the longer you're in ELL or potentially the later you engaged in ELL, the longer it takes to exit ELL. Mm -hmm. So if we're um, serving English language learners early on, we can typically uh, they typically exit. Quicker. Okay, I totally and, believe that assertion. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I've ever seen the data on that, mm -hmm. and I would love to, mm -hmm. because if you, if kids who are coming in in K-5 are exiting the ELL program on average after a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So the rate of exiting yeah. is what you're looking length at. Mm -hmm. Length of enrollment, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That would really be interesting. Okay. Um, but it's, it, anyway, so this is something where I'm, I, I generally am very happy with the performance of the ELL program. Once they've left ELL, the gaps are acceptably small. Um, but this was one where I was like, hmm, okay, in 10th grade, there's room to be improved. Um, but, you know, I also, uh, let's see, okay, so that was comment number one. This is a piece that I flagged. Now, the other one that I, I, I slide 32, your stratified table is beautiful. It's where I was planning to go. Props to you and your team, even, I mean, you're 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 going down the right road, and this is something where there's additional pieces to this where I can show you sort of what the s synthesis is, um, and to my lack of credit, my intuition didn't pan out on one of these strata that I was very interested in seeing, um, and that is my. My working hypothesis was that we wouldn't see a significant difference in the rate at which one met standard as long as students were not low income. Well, actually, it turned out to be the flip side of that. If you compare the low income students, the rate at which they're meeting standard between the blacks and the whites, it's not significantly different. It's only if they are not low income that there was a significant excess of not at 
standard in the African Americans. That was really interesting. But you know, this is the sort of thing where I think we're, we're evolving towards something. Fortunately, here we don't even have to worry about population sampling. This is you, you have the actual population. You can calculate in honest to goodness relative risk. And you know, some of these differences, I, the chi squared on a two by two p, it, we're talking p values that are zero. There's no way it's random. This is something which is structural in the system, and it gives us something that maybe we can get some leverage on. But getting to Mark's point, describing its only start. You have to know what to measure and how to start to form hypotheses, but your hypotheses, they can be wrong, but they have to be hypotheses because you gotta figure out what are you gonna do about it. Try that and define how you're gonna measure success or failure of these new interventions. Chris, to your point about the 10th graders, mm -hmm question comes to mind that maybe we ought to be looking at, as we look at this data, uh, especially when it comes to the 10th graders where there's such a gap, are, we me are the kids that we're having in ELL at that point and we're measuring, mm -hmm. when did they come to us? Did they come to us in ninth grade, 10th grade? Did they come to us in second grade? Yeah. And there's that follow-up. So it's the idea of- The migratory component. Yeah, uh, the idea of all of a sudden you're having a, a major learning curve at a higher age, mm -hmm. and therefore they don't have the time, if you will, in, in harness to be able to get up to that standard. Right. And that's, that's the whole thing, is that the first step is to describe it in ways that will allow you to generate these hypotheses. Then you look at it and it's like, what are the things that I think are the best piece to dive into? That's actually, I mean, sorry, it's real nerdy of me, but I'm having a ball with this analysis. It's looking at things, it's interpreting where are we at. Um, Yes, I would like to see us at 95% in all groups, but just being able to say, well, gosh, here are some interesting gaps. Are we interested in focusing and closing particular gaps, or is our priority a global thing on just raising performance across the board? That's the discussion that becomes possible once we've looked at the data, and I'm very excited about it. Going back to your 10th grade, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, that's all right. Going back to your 10th grade thing again, it occurred to me, um, while we've looked at how we can improve the ELL students who come to us in third and fifth grade because of all the, we've got the time, maybe what we need to do is look at a strategy too of how to improve the person, the child who comes to us in 10th grade as an ELL student and approach it differently mm -hmm. because they've got a very small window of time to improve. It's a different context. Ranked. Yeah. And so it's very intensive. And it also comes at a time when everything's intensive. Yeah. And I think we need to have a different approach for that change, if you will, or that uh, key to that puzzle, as opposed to the one in the earlier grades. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's when we're sort of taking the data that we've seen and asking, OK, is that gap of exited ELL relative to never ELL, does it persist if we only look at kids who we've had for more than five years? And that at tenth grade is basically how did we have them in elementary? So, you you it allows us to frame the challenge. Where where is the leverage we might be able to get on on the system? Because it might be that we have a particular opportunity to improve performance by focusing on kids who are older when they arrive as ELL, and improving that piece of the system rather than saying ELL as a whole. And needs to improve. I do think the presentation spoke to that. It that does. was a discussion to it the really language does. acquisition specifically that we're speaking to in the vocabulary and the psyops. Yep. So there is that piece that I think that was captured yeah. um, as one component of one of the strategies that so was going to be. So I, I do think that's being talked about and yeah. thought about as this is being found. Absolutely. So I do want to highlight those components. Then the question is from there, how does that play out in the long run and then what adaptation is made based upon that. So I think that's that piece that yeah. still remains to be seen how it plays out. But I do think that is a component. Something I think we should take a look at is in 10th grade, ELL students, how many of them are going out and getting jobs? And I'm not sure if we track that anymore. When my oldest started working, he actually had to have a building administrator sign off before he could, okay. So we should have some data on that. It would be interesting to see how many of them are going to work at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, question on the ELL students, and I'm, perhaps we've answered this before and I just don't recall. Do we have a, a number on how many of those students stay as ELL students per se for X number of years. My point is, you know, we know the average perhaps they get out, but do we, I'm wondering if that 10th grade student who
who may have been with us for five years, if he or she's been a five-year ELL student, what are we not doing right to be able to improve their yeah. language understanding, to be able to improve their science and math understanding? I don't know. Mm -hmm. We do have that data. Uh, we haven't incorporated it into the ER reports, but it's in our program report for ELL and some. So we can, uh, yeah. But we yes, there might we be do some, have the data. There might be some interesting people are in. links. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. And so uh, building off that. Yeah. Go ahead. You might have I'm ELL. Are still on ELL? You, you you finish ELL because I got a different direction to go. I was going to go to low income. Yeah. Great. I'll catch up. <laughs> um, there actually, it was a combination across all the board. I appreciate all the work with the equity. Um, just want to highlight that. I know that's been a focus, and we've talked about it for a long time, the equity teams in that piece. I think that's really valuable, and that needs to continue in really looking at how we address student performance. So that would be a strong focus to continue in the time coming, in which to do it from a broad perspective. Um, the other component, and it was touched on in the presentation, dealing with experiences. Um, and this goes back to making me think of Bob Hughes's presentation that spoke about framework and opportunities that our students come with and that those are dependent often as to your background, your context that you come to the table with, much as language, also your economic class can do that. So how will we be working? So I guess the piece that is how do you determine the need to expand opportunities to experience science and what that would mean for the exploration piece? Is that through extracurricular? Is that through PTA? Is that with, through field trips? I was thinking of North Star's presentation earlier today and they spoke about their monthly field trip, going out and doing things, or the mimicry, biomimicry engineering. How effectively are we utilizing those experiences to enhance this and give the kids a framework to be able to move these things in places that we can't. I, I mean, lots of kids go to summer camps that are doing different science things and things, is that's not all our kids. So there might be a piece of how do we build that component in stronger and better that I would like to, that I think could move those things. Um, so it's not curriculum necessarily as much as the hands-on problem base, but really building that big for all students. Um, and that's my one piece. Building off of that, one of the pieces of the low income, I, I, I very much appreciate what we do have, but if there was one slide I could add to the low income discussion, it would be a comparison of the fifth grade low income in our Title I buildings versus fifth grade low income in our non-Title I buildings. It's not building by building, it's just two groups, because I suspect that those might be two different challenges. I don't know if the gap is wider or narrower in Title I. My working hypothesis would be that it sh should be narrower, mm -hmm. but I'd like to know. I'd also like to know what extracurriculars are provided around it within yes. that school setting. What's the support system being provided? And the, for, for particularly at slide 24, the, 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 the gaps persist fifth, eighth, and tenth for low income, but they don't seem to get wider. So it's, we're treading water on low income performance, but at least we're not losing ground. That the gap in fifth, and eight, fifth grade is about 30 points. In eighth grade, it's about 30 points. So it's not getting worse as they go through the system. So this is something where potentially intervention at earlier ages could pan out further down the system. To Mark. Cassandra's point earlier about the ELL students in 10th grade and uh, those who may be working at that point, I think we ought to look at that same information for low income because I think it holds, holds the same, true just as well for one, both of those groups, to be quite frank, because both of those groups are more likely to be working already by 10th grade, if not 9th, 8th. Mm. Yeah, and that's something I, I agree that, I, I mean, it just never occurred to me to ask. I, I usually feel like I know what data exists, but yeah. Um, if we have data. That said, this is a world where I have discovered, having now got a kid in college, that it is impossible to get a paper route. So that first job is becoming a challenge to acquire in this neighborhood. I, it's not impossible, but it's definitely a no, different it's game. working as a bus boy. Working bus boy is still out there, yeah. yes. And then she's, yeah, they're still there. Um, how many uh, WANIC summer school programs do we offer that contain science? Because I believe last summer they were free or very low income, $50 for like 10 days, a very substantial all day long um, course. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so we do track that data too, and I think we even presented it in the uh, CTE presentation so we can loop back with that, but you're right, there's a, a big opportunity for uh, students to access courses in the summer that are relative, almost free. Right. You only have to pay if you want to um, receive tech prep credit right. for those, or dual lang or not dual language, sorry, um, dual credit. The other thing just on that line that this reminds me of and this is some of what Siri was talking to is we are doing right now an assessment of our own summer programs and I, we, I'm trying to remember if we did the program report on summer programs recently and I think we, we did earlier this year. I'm just trying to remember or maybe we've just talked about it internally. And so uh, what we're trying to do, given that there are many students who can access programs through DigiPen uh, and different uh, organizations across the area which are wonderful wonderful programs and often come with quite a bit expense as well are there things that we can learn as a system things that we can offer through our summer programs that are more camp more hands-on more experiential not necessarily just um, kind of what we've considered core academic summer school especially at the elementary level uh, and what uh, so we've got a um, work going on in that area so we can take a look at what we do in our district and do some different unique things. I think we need to make sure that um, we don't just offer it, that we face-to-face -face talk with students yeah. about how beneficial it would be if they could participate so they know the opportunity is there. And I also think that if, as we look at that and we look to promote it to those students, if even if it's only $15, $15 to a low-income student is a lot of money. So I think we can work very easily with the foundation to bridge that gap for those low-income students. Uh, I could see that being uh, something that would be very uh, uh, attractive to the foundation. Great. Um, I have a data request for future presentations. Well, first I'm gonna make the request and then I want the board to help me decide if it's one uh, worth doing. Um, the, I think it would be, I was just in, looking through the districts that were above us for low income and I was, I was noticing, and this is sort of, and it, I, I didn't do a complete study, but um, it appears could, that. Could one the, of you just advance or go back to so we can yeah, see the, the majority, slide? The majority of Eric, those. Eric, can you just give yeah. us a slide number real quick? Oh. Uh, what does it say? I don't, I don't know. Um, is it in the little orange in the left? three. Thank you. Maybe. Great. Oh, right. Uh, the majority of the districts that are above us appear to have a higher percentage of their students that are low income. Mm -hmm. it, I don't know if there's a way to interpose that in future presentations, the percentage of, and I just was looking at OSPI, mm -hmm. um, the percentage of students in the district that are low income. And I also don't know, and then the, my follow-up question for the board would be, what would, <laughs> would that tell us anything that would be useful? I, I was mostly curious. I don't know what that how that would help feed back in and what, but, but to me, it, to but it is, it, and how. well, right, it does raise questions of, well, is there, you know, I mean, are there sort of economies of scale, I guess, and ways that you can implement if you have a higher percentage of your student? I was surprised to see that because you would think that what more uh, districts that are more well resourced would be able to combat um, mm -hmm. achievement gaps better. Uh, that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. The question is, what would we do with that information That's if right, we I had it? I actually don't know other than and answer I'm my curiosity. Um, I, I don't know how that would be helpful, but I was, most, I was curious about it, so. It's interesting because this is consistent with a conversation we were having uh, about the data earlier today in that it's interesting that oftentimes, so if we take income as an example, uh, from a system, if we structure our programs and strategies and practices to meet the majority of our clientele and the majority of our clientele or the vast majority of our clientele are not low income our low income percentage is 11 and a half percent district wide then you tend to direct you tend to not um, if, if that's making sense versus if you're a district where 
the, the you know 80 percent of your population that is your clientele then you're going to maybe more easily and more readily as a system make the changes needed to serve to appropriately serve your clientele so i think that is a interesting we were having a very similar conversation of given that you know the bellevues and the north shores and the issaquas are, are sort of typically who we think about as our comparable districts uh we're these districts are outperforming and it's not so much about how much how wealthy the district is it's about the population of students right so even if um, Bellevue like it's not so much about That's resourcing right. a, from That's a right. district I think it's about how the system flexes and changes to meet the clientele that you're serving and so I think that's a conversation I think that this data helps us ha begin to have that conversation right. um, as a system and go how do we need to change and not just go oh well we don't have to worry about you know because the vast majority of our students aren't that right mm -hmm. that's right well I, th but I think though the idea of seeing what they're doing would help us address and target those students who are in that group because there may be a, uh, a program that we can look at for pull out for I, I don't know how to address it to be quite frank but with the idea of being able to address the problems that, that they face in completing schoolwork in being having time to address schoolwork that we can assist with and again it may take beyond the district itself it may take the various agencies that are in the community but the idea that we have those folks those kids in our school system and we they deserve our help and the only way you're going to break a cycle of poverty is to educate and this is something I, I, I want to say yes. Um, and the, 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 I, I just was at Lakeview. Lakeview's a microcosm of the whole district, about 14% low income. Um, and they have just uh, started providing bus service from the school after their extended hours back to the t to local low income housing units allowing those students to stay for additional help without worrying about getting home and allowing the parents not to worry about getting them home either it seems to have be having an impact with them i, I that's the sort of thing where it's like dude little pilots exist around the district and hey uh if they show results then fabulous so anyway um okay so we're done with low income uh shall we touch on sped Actually, I have nothing specific to science from the SPED conversation. There are gaps. They're persistent and large gaps. But I still feel like the, I, I'm not in a position to interpret the gaps until we can subset SPED into the specific learning disabilities as compared to other global cognitive deficits. So. I agree that it's going to be difficult to, to separate those. I think where we're going to find the it's not an overall panacea, but a, a great way to address it is going to be through the team teaching. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's how we're going to be able to address the SPED gaps in science as well as math, mm -hmm. to be quite frank, because until you do, uh, it's, I don't think it's going to change. And I think that perhaps transcends uh, the diagnosis. Well, actually, Mark, I think you just put your finger on something that's very important. It, it's not about the SPED gap in math or the SPED gap in science. At this point, having seen science, ELA, and math, it's about the SPED gap. There is a SPED gap. Across the board. It's across yeah. the board, and understanding what we can do about that is the bigger picture. And I think also perhaps the, the, the scores on SPED, the idea is, too, that we're, we need to look at not only the kids who are being able to be mainstreamed or uh, be integrated into the regular classroom, but also the science scores, the math scores mm -hmm. for those who are staying in the SPED program for most of their program. Mm -hmm. Because I think we need to start addressing how to teach those values or those, uh, the science values, the, sci the math values that, uh, in uh, a manner that addresses their abilities mm -hmm. and also then builds on them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, those scores are never gonna move. Yeah. Any further comments on the SPED subset? Okay. Um, 
I do have some feedback on indicators, though. The yes. passing science in ninth grade, and I think this actually goes across the board. I think that was taken in some regards as we were from the other one that we were looking at. How is this leading towards graduation failure? Of course, I don't find that a useful indicator to look at for the most part of passing science in ninth grade. If the goal is three years, if they have to have three years of science, it also doesn't tell us what level of science that's being taken at that point in time. Um, so I'd like to revise it. I'm not completely convinced what it should be, um, but I don't find it useful. Um, I don't see it correlating to anything. I'm not sure what action would be taken on it based on it. I can't evaluate much from it. Um, you can see how favorable I am to it. Uh, <laughs> no, I, actually, Siri, I've, 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 I have a similar reaction. I, I just was, you know, one of the good things to do is not just to ask for new pieces, but to look at things and say, hey, this isn't giving me the information I thought I was going to get. And I kind of feel that way about the ninth grade data so, so far. So I don't far. know if it's more at the, you know, that they, by sophomore year, they have two years of, or they, they I don't, are they required to do biology and chemistry? I'm not sure I those are required anymore. To, uh, it's just science the graduation years, requirement is three labs. years of science yeah three credits of science two lab and that's not tied at all to what type but i don't think biology so is specified so. explicitly anymore could those indicator figures though give us not so much what's been or what they've gotten to the, that point but what they need then from there on hmm. that's what i'm wondering if that indicator could be really a signpost for saying okay they've been able to achieve this much and what do we need to do to ensure the fact that they will then accelerate or be able to assimilate into the, the higher or more advanced sciences and, that, and does that make sense to it, you? It, it makes sense I, I my, my instinct well, on this the gateway is science that there, there, there are two different there are two different conversations to have the first is are we really satisfied with the indicator that we're seeing and then there's the conversation which is a much deeper conversation about what do we think we'd like to replace what was the question we're really trying to answer here and i think that second conversation is for the extended study session in march Good idea. so if we can just put that on our agenda for then we'll really dig into that mm -hmm. um because i i don't think this one's necessarily specific to science either no it goes that was the math wing why we exactly. requested algebra math, instead it would that be way the too. same concept so anyway we'll revisit that it's it's you know, we're still learning our way through this as well, so it's not a fault right. to be assessed. And my key thing is just to sort of try to get these things documented so then we can look at them in March. Yeah. Um, dual credit course in science. Did they go on to take an AP and IB, a college and high school? Um, because that's a component of are we succeeding at getting them college ready? Mm -hmm. um, career ready, many of the tech fields will require, and that can be across the board when we say a dual credit course. It could be a CTE course that's doing the dual credit. It could be whichever possibility, but really looking towards that component because um, they have to have the foundational science in which to get there and be able to succeed there. So that would be the other component. Um, and we talked about it, and I don't know how you measure it, so I'm just going to toss it out. It doesn't mean it has to happen. Um, something to deal with opportunity to explore science concepts, extracurricular during school, secondary during summer. How effectively are we getting that opportunity out there for our students? And the incentive for it, I, to be quite I, frank. I, that they come and take them would be the key. Make them want to take it. Right. Want to take it and not just to get the concepts, but that there's a reason for them to want to, to get the bug. Yeah. But those are just possible. I don't know if we can, I don't know if I'd jump on it for next year, but that's just one of those things that I can see that as being, thinking about the presentation and science as experience and framework and that how do we look towards that, so. Yeah, and this, this is one of the challenges in terms of where does the ER end and where do the programs begin? Because for me, it's always kind of, you know, is opportunity, if opportunity belongs here, then my instinct is, well, I'd like to know which AP courses are available in science at each of our high schools. Uh, I mean, are there gaps across those things? It's a one slide table of who's got what. But uh, I'm not sure that that belongs in the ER. But if the data is showing you have discrepancy in which your students are accessing AP and IB, uh, then the question would be go explore, figure out why. Yeah. And that would be the next step in which to do so. Yeah. So again, I think that's, some, let, let's take, that's a deep conversation for March. So let's take that one to the retreat. To that point, though, as we're, especially as we're looking at the student who's looking at uh, more of a trade mm -hmm. school uh, application, but yet, neat, God knows, uh, as computerized as mechanics are these days, and 
all the other trades that you can think of. Um, I, mm. I wonder if we're talking perhaps, we're only talking alpha and omega here. We're talking regular science. We're talking AP science. Mm -hmm. Should we be perhaps talking about technical science oh, or I vocational science, if you will? Yeah. Somewhere in between, you know, I, I don't know. I, oh, I'm, no, I, I do, because I, I agree. Because I, I think we, that may be where we're missing the, the point with those kids who, they don't consider themselves, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm saying this from a, a uh, self-esteem standpoint, they don't see themselves as an AP student, mm -hmm. but they know that they have an interest in X or Y or Z, mm -hmm. and but they know that they're going to need some science, but they don't know how to really go about doing it. And they're not incentivized to go beyond the uh, um, the regular science class, so they're going to go for their minimum. But it's not quite enough for what they need for the trades, if you will. Well, and what you, I, I, what I hear you getting at is something I was already thinking about in terms of the CTEs for science. Access to science is something that is, for many kids, driven by something that pulls them into it. Mm -hmm. And for the kid who didn't always consider themselves a scientist, when physics got around to torque and inertia and suddenly was relevant to engines and cars, I had friends who were like, oh, as long as they hadn't been knocked off of the path already. Early on. And so it's like, how do you make sure that they've got the, the opportunity? But this plays into what we were talking about earlier in the study session. The, the seven period day gives us an opportunity to expand the offerings of these things that bring kids in and engage them on the stuff that they're passionate about, which just happens to require them to do math, science, or other pieces. But also, but also yeah. that, that by virtue of looking at that middle area, mm -hmm. it allows us to, because the AP, let's face it, it, it we're talking about the 4.0, the 3.9 student, yeah. whatever, the students I would never be anyway. But we can I'm get you looking, through one if we tried hard enough. Trust me. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the B and the C student mm -hmm. and trying to find a niche for him or her mm -hmm. that, uh, that the sciences and the mathematics will actually, because they'll need it. Yeah. And the employers need those employees. Yeah. And to be able to uh, answer that need and to make our students desirable to industry, to employers, yeah. we need to be able to address that middle. Right. So I, I guess that's something downstream it would be real nice to know about the science electives and not just, you know, I mean, much as I love marine biology, it's, it's the CTE type electives, whether they're, um, I, I was talking to someone earlier today about um, the requirement for physics as a prerequisite for kids who are working in a forensic lab. What? But nonetheless, how do you integrate that in so that kid gets the physics they need without having to take the physics separately that knocks them off the forensic science pathway. So um, it, 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 I'm very interested in seeing these alternative paths develop where, I mean, whether we call it applied or whatever, it's, it's truly useful to the student. And it lets them opt into things that really play to their passions. I think so. it's basically looking at applied sciences as, a, as yeah. opposed to just the um, well, trust me, uh, in woodworking, one used to learn a lot of these important applied sciences. Well, <laughs> um, um, angles, and et cetera, the math the of it, yeah. 3D printing class like they had yeah. over at uh, Redmond High, and you see the students who are in there. Oh, sorry. We're, we're, yeah. Eric brings up a really good point. Fascinating topic, but uh, we are not on. And uh, I, much as I love Nancy, I, I vowed to myself that I would not be Nancy. But to wrap that concept, yes. Just back around. you are looking at being able to deal with CTA, CTE and make sure that those components are also addressed. And so that will be something I recommend in March that we do look at. If that is the case and we value that as the board, we should look at how would we right. know it is occurring. Yep. If that is a piece we want to evaluate on from the cult for the idea that we're reaching the mission and vision. So I think that can tie in very well in which to do that. All right. So one last thing. Okay. But this one isn't difficult. It's on the target when we spoke to, when we do it within schools, our comparables, we call them. If I remember correctly from our extended work study session, it actually wasn't a comparable we spoke to. We spoke to it being in a quartile of the top quartile or or that, and I would recommend we actually don't state it as comparable. How are we doing in our compare? But we actually state we should be in the top five overall. We should be within the top 
10 of any subgroup and sort of work it at that way as opposed to a general set what it is as opposed to just stating comparable. It's not a target currently. <laughs> it's an observation. Yeah. So that one, again, I think is an extended study session topic. Yep. So, all right. So. It's extending the yeah, I know this extended study session might be extendable, um, but okay. So um, from here, um, actually, sorry. Do you have any final? Yeah. You okay? You guys have been very thorough. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's all right. Um, I just don't want you to be afraid. That's to a double-edged comment. <laughs> yes. Um, so from here, the the plan now, um, Diane, if you can send out to all five of us the blank form. You don't have to do a full report. It's just hit your highlights for each of the sections and bounce those back to me. If uh, what was today? If it's Monday, if yeah. Can I, just a clarification. So, as part of the process during individual board comment time, Diane's been capturing what board members have yes. been saying. So, uh, do you want that sent back to each individual board member or Actually, just Chris would, as the? That would be great. Um, but, you know, honestly, my, my instinct is that after our conversation, each of you has in your head, what are the big three? What are the, what are the things that you think are really important? And you can synthesize those in. I can work with the main mm -hmm. transcript to build out a framework. But it's yeah. really, for me, it's about getting the priorities from you. So do you think the transcript, just from a process perspective of Diane doing that, is that helpful or is it more helpful just to have the conversation and then after reflection about what everyone has said, just be able to send your three priorities to the person who's responsible? Like, I don't know if it's just too much information or... It would be TMI. <laughs> so we're just trying to figure out our process too yeah. to help enable the board to do what what you need to do. So if Diane doesn't need to do that, then we can... I, I haven't written the summary as Chris has, I did find that yeah. that to be useful and being able to capture through. But we also had not done this step of that information coming back from the board members individually either. That hadn't occurred. So if that step gets added, arguably you would not need to have that verbatim. Yeah, so but I, I think that step has to be added. Otherwise, I'd like to try it first. Lost. Okay. Um, sure. In the long run, it's not. I'm not saying Diane is not useful. It <laughs> may not be necessary for Diane to do this. I'm, thank goodness she's got faster fingers than I will ever have for the typing. So, um, but uh, so the plan would be she's going to send out to you um, the, just the blank form. Put your highlights in. It's not necessarily. You don't have to write the whole thing because I want to know what really resonated with you of what we've discussed, and then I'll try and synthesize on behalf of the board. Um, if you can get it back to me by, uh, let's say Thursday, um, then over the weekend I will try and get it synthesized, allowing me to distribute it back to everybody on Monday. That gives us a week to read through it and think about it coming into we don't have the conversation the in two weeks. Yes, our oh, next board meeting is January. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm ahead of schedule for once. No. Um, the point is. <laughs> Okay, in that case, Eighth. in that case, it's just fine. Why don't you take a week, if you can get back to me by next Monday with your filled-in thing. Oh, yeah. If I haven't received it by Wednesday, I'll assume I'm not going, no. <laughs> I, I, but uh, you've got a week, get it back to me by next Monday. I will try and do the synthesis and send it back out to make everybody feel like it, the ball's in their court and not mine um, as fast as I can, ideally well before the holidays. Um, but our next meeting is January 8th. Eighth, so we got a lot of time, um, and since we're going into this, Diane, I would really appreciate a reminder email to all five of us on, like, a week before. Well, let's make it the second. Um, <laughs> the first, we might be liable to overlook that email, but a reminder email on the second. Here's the, make sure that you have looked at this, and I'll even send it to her so she can make sure that she, it's at the top of your email inbox. The synthesized report for discussion. So if I'm following this correctly, you are asking that we are to send you back our Your highlights, highlights, let's just say, of the meeting and yep. discussion and review yep. by Wednesday. Yep, this Wednesday. Then you will turn that back around to us and then make sure that it, we review it before the next meeting on the 8th. Bingo. Okay. Which gives us lots of time to review it that are independent of the holiday schedule. So, 
All right. Oh. Any amendment? Okay. Mm -hmm. Everybody cool with that? Great. It's a plan. And so I um, just want to um, thank you for uh, kind of making this shift to having the dialogue be here because, as you know, end results reporting is my responsibility uh, as as superintendent. And so the framework and all this put together, not to at all diminish the hard work that Mike has done and Tim Krieger has done and Matt and John and others in helping to prepare and put the presentations together. So I just wanted to clarify why no. it's, uh, I just want to make sure we're, you know, not shifting it. So we've got different people helping with the presentations each time. Matt did one, Matt, uh, Mike's done two, John will do the next one. And um, right. so just in terms of, that was my- That's fine. I, I, I kind heard of that and I, that, so it's thank not a big deal. Thank you. So. It's just a matter of turning our bodies and putting our backs <laughs> exactly. to other members. Uh, I blame yeah. that on Thank the design you. of this room and yeah. chip. So, um. <laughs> if I can, when is our next ends result? It's ER3, correct? Right, which is completely new, new and never been done before. Um, ER3, or is one next? One might be next. I'll have to go and look at our schedule. Oh, was it ER1? Uh, think about. Uh, three comes in when we get the reports. We've never done a three yeah. before. No, so sorry, one comes in when we get the report. That's fine. Right, so one is One's a little bit later. Like three February. might be next. Yeah. Honestly, I'd have to go back and double check. Yeah. I don't have the... Three's going to be tough. It is in here, Diane. Thank you. Because it would in be good to part? just write our process as to where it's at. And have, I know we have it written down, but it's still morphing as it goes through so that we can just make sure we have that clear so it's a little easier to remember where okay. we're at. So, pardon me. Thank you, Diane. February 5th is the board meeting where we'll be presenting interdisciplinary skills and attributes. So that's ER3 independently. It's one that we um, haven't done before, but... We're going to give it a it's whirl. It's going to be an ER and we should <laughs> review it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's February 5th. And that's actually a beautiful one for the CTEs. So. Although I'm not sure that's t today in our agreed upon key performance indicators, oh, okay. right? That's all right? So we do have. It's just in, an opportunity. Yeah. I, I have I no mean, idea what it's going to look like. Yeah. So. All right. Okay. Cool. Great. Thank you. So. Um, that brings us to, uh, that was board policy on science, brings us to program reports. Do we have a program report? We do. Evening? So we have uh, physical education tonight. So, so Mike's back and, uh, and, and Mike will be taking questions. <laughs> Report. He and I both will. But so, uh, program as uh, associate superintendent of student academic success services. Uh, as you know, Mike uh, oversees teaching and learning, and so uh, curriculum and our uh, instructional program. So he's presenting uh, and providing an update on PE for us this evening. So we'll provide an overview and then um, some um, connections back to the program report we shared last year. Um, so as we've mentioned in our other program reports, we want to connect to our end results and executive limitations. Um, and so in particular, um, as we think about PE, we think about um, citizenship, personal attributes, um, some of the social um, connections, and then more specifically, um, connection to life management. Um, there are definitely academic thinking skills taught in physical education, communication, collaboration, and teamwork, and personal attributes are all um, foundational skills that are built into physical education. Um, as you know, uh, physical education is more than being out and being active. It's also the knowledge that goes with being active and um, the fitness and the health that's connected to physical education. Um, and in fact, we have standards for physical education that have just been updated. Uh, in 2016, Washington State adopted new physical education and health standards. And so we are in the process of um, aligning our current curriculum and standards with the new Washington State physical education standards. They're similar in a lot of ways. They have some more nuance to them, um, but it's a, there's some good connections too with what we already have in our system um, and working on things that are related to, as we mentioned, both knowledge of fitness as well as actually doing and demonstrating the ability to be fit um, all through grades K-12. So when we look at physical education by uh, grade bands or um, elementary and secondary, um, in elementary, as you know, we have uh, physical education in all of our schools. It's two 30-minute classes each week um, where kids come with their classes. They use curriculum that we adopted in 2013. And we also have very specific power standards that all of our teachers across the system emphasize to make sure that kids are gaining those important knowledge and skills. Um, and 
there are some wonderful units to make sure that um, physical education is engaging and connects to all sorts of different types of kids. Um, so there are both combinations of team sports and individual, um, fitness and skill-oriented things that really connect with lots of kids. Because as you know, some kids will um, be connecting with a team sport, some might want to connect individually, and so whatever ways we can get kids to be thinking about lifelong fitness are important. In middle school, uh, we provide uh, physical education in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade classes. And again, um, curriculum that we adopted recently in 2013, it was a um, K-12 adoption, uh, power standards. And then we also have some really wonderful online uh, fitness tracking programs that help kids to be thinking about how do you monitor your fitness over time and set goals and um, work towards improving your fitness as a lifelong skill because we know how important that is. Um, and again, as in elementary, we look at developing a whole series of skills and really giving students a well-rounded uh, approach to physical fitness so that they're thinking about being connected over their lifetime, regardless of um, their backgrounds or interests. In high school, it starts to become a little bit more specific. We do have very um, specific credit requirements, but we also provide um, some really wonderful options for kids. And again, a core curriculum and elective courses as well. Uh, as I mentioned, an adoption recently. And so uh, we're be, we'll be thinking about, we're thinking about, again, how do you connect and tie, as kids are moving out into the world, um, fitness with some of their other experiences. And so we want to take a moment just to talk about some of the connections to um, our other uh, physical education and physical fitness types of activities that kids will access in high school in a minute. Uh, so some of the courses that are available kind of across the board in all of our high schools, um, we have a common ninth grade fitness class, but then we also have things like recreational fitness, conditioning, weight training, um, care and prevention of athletic injuries. That's one of those knowledge-based courses that we talked about, Outdoor Adventures. So oh, I uh, told Mike I wanted to do this part uh, specifically myself because I have a long history with it and I know questions often come up. And so um, this has to do with the credit requirement uh, for PE and the, the WAC uh, that specifies that there's a, um, an ability for students to be actually an RCW that says students can be excused from earning the PE credit under certain circumstances and how we deal with that as a school district. So uh, the, um, the requirement for all students, just like I have to earn three science credits and four English credits, the state graduation requirement is that students have to earn 1.5 uh, PE credits by high school coursework in physical education. So that's, that's the, um, the requirement. There is law, state law, that says students may be excused from participation in PE coursework for um, various reasons or on account of. So physical disability, employment, religious belief, participation in directed athletics, meaning school sports. So if I participate in school sports, I may seek to be excused from participating in PE coursework. That means I can take something else in lieu of PE and earn, have another elective or something to take, okay? Also, uh, participation in military science and tactics and for other good cause. So um, we've created a form for how to do this and so forth that is in alignment with the law. The law goes on to say if you're excused from PE, so if you have sought to be excused and you are, you've been granted uh, approval to be excused from PE, you must demonstrate proficiency slash competency in the knowledge portion of the fitness requirements. So as Mike, Mike shared, there are PE standards and uh, you have to demonstrate while you are being excused from the physical part because of one of the reasons above, you have to demonstrate competency or uh, proficiency in the knowledge portion. So uh, we provide different avenues for students to uh, demonstrate that proficiency or competency uh, through either a knowledge assessment, so a, a, an assessment, a fitness plan, and so those are the two options, and we give students multiple opportunities throughout the year to demonstrate proficiency. And so again, the WAC and RCW references are there as well as the reference to our um, graduation policy. So uh, I think the important kind of underlying piece here, and this is from an OSPI document from Washington State on the health and fitness standards, they really differentiate between physical education, physical activity, 
and athletics. So this, uh, the, the graduation requirement is for physical education, meaning a planned program of curriculum, it's aligned to standards, et cetera, versus physical activity, uh, which is bodily movement, <laughs> versus athletics, and they go, are very specific that athletics are not a replacement of physical activity or excuse me, of physical education. Now I'm getting it goofed up. But I just think this is helpful. Again, we review it kind of every year um, as to why you know, we're in compliance with the law and how we approach that. You can go on. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so looking at that um, course taking pattern for some of our students, we looked at um, last year's data that we presented and we also pulled this year's data for the students who take only PE coursework, as well as students who are doing a combination and then students that do um, a fitness plan or an assessment only. Uh, slight uptick in the number of students, the percentage of students taking PE coursework. Uh, not, I don't know, we, we pull the numbers for you, but I, it's not a huge difference, but um, we do have a, the majority of our kids taking PE directly and then about um, 15, 30%, depending on the combination of coursework and assessment only. One of the things we look at um, as we're looking at our program reports is what kind of data that's out there. We did pull our um, 2016 Healthy Youth Survey data just to look at um, how active kids are and the types of fitness habits they have. Really, I think what we, what we see in this data as we look at these two slides is that having a foundational fitness program and fitness education is really important given the amount of activity that kids get on their own um, and the fact that oftentimes there are years where kids aren't active. Having those skills and knowledge are really important in those years where they aren't taking physical education. Uh, we did compare the 16 to the 2014 data which we presented to you last year. There weren't any um, areas that stood out as significantly higher or lower given the margin of error, so we didn't share the side by side. They're very comparable to last year's. The last thing we wanted to do tonight was uh, give you an update on uh, adapted PE. Last year we shared just what the state of adapted PE is and our approach to providing students who um, have special education services. And we have a little bit um, to share on that tonight in terms of updates. Um, but just as a reminder, uh, we have to, we are required to provide options for students who have um, an individual educational program um, that are required um, to pro we're provided, required to provide a free and appropriate public education um, for students who may need accommodations or modifications or adjustments because of a disability. And so that might be things related to physical or motor skills, um, and there are a whole range of types of things that we can do in that. Um, when we're adapting physical, physical education, we're really looking at kind of two approaches. One would be that we have a general education class where the teacher and the special education teacher might work together to make some adjustments or modifications to how the program's delivered. And um, students are with an IEP that uh, have physical education needs are in a general education class and adjustments are being made. And then sometimes we also have specialized PE classes in our district, those are adaptive PE, where there's a very specific structured class that meets the very specific needs of students as determined not only through the IEP but a team approach where a special education teacher, maybe a physical therapist and a physical education teacher are working together. Um, so very specifically, this is called out in um, the WAC as well, um, and that talks um, about the ways that we can provide those types of services. And um, they ideally are provided in an environment where kids are getting experiences similar to their peers. And in some cases, we know that's not always possible, and sometimes it's not appropriate. Sometimes there are very specific specialized needs. So when we look at what um, we have more specifically in Lake Washington, um, we have many students with IEPs that have nothing to do with physical education and no modifications are needed. And so um, students will be in a general ed physical education class. And then we have students with IEPs that specifically call out a need to address physical education, and that might be either served in a general ed class, in PE class with modifications, or in a specialty class. Um, in this case, in, in our district, we have adaptive PE in elementary school, and that's a program where, in some cases, um, a special education teacher, physical therapist, and then partnering with a PE teacher would say there are some needs that would be met um, either in having this class in addition to the general education PE or in some cases um, as the 
way that we deliver PE instruction. So the update between this year and last year is we are currently looking at some options at the secondary level that would be more specialized than a general education class with modifications. And so right now we have some folks that are visiting Seattle. Um, we are looking at um, at least one of the things that is at least one um, specialized class in each secondary school. And so Paul uh, Vine and John Holman started that work last year and there's some work that's taking place on that just to see if we can staff it and what it would look like and scheduling and then we'll use the information we get through our visits from other neighboring districts to inform that development. Um, and again, that's not always the approach, that's not always the right approach, but in cases where it would be um, having a specialized class, that's something we're looking into. And so that is, um, as I mentioned, sometimes those go together. Uh, that's our report. Questions for Tim? So I've actually got two. Mm -hmm. um, they're tightly related. So, um, and I'm going to dive into the knowledge test and or the fitness plan. Uh, this last year, it was 16% of our graduating class had, fit it, had, had satisfied it through the fitness plan assessment or the plan only. That translates to about 300 kids. Um, the uh, 144 of whom come from Tesla STEM, where that's how mm -hmm. their students fit it without having a PE instruction on site. Um, I'm not sure if ICS takes it either, um, takes PE classes, um, with the consequence that you're left with the rest of the district combined has as many kids taking the fitness assessment slash plan option as one alternative school. I don't think that the word is getting out there very well. Now, the second part of this is if I go on our own website and I use the find it fast and I type in physical fitness knowledge test, I find a whole bunch of stuff about what the policies are and nothing about how to take one. We need to have a website that's easily found. If you search on PE knowledge test, physical fitness plan, all of these things lead to policies. None of them lead to how do you do it. That needs to be on our website. Mm -hmm. um, because, and admittedly, I'm not quite as distressed about this because the seven period day makes part of my concern about PE go away. But having to take three semesters of PE instead of three semesters of whatever you're passionate about in a 24, core 24 environment, sucks, um, unless you're passionate about PE. So anyway, um, I very much want to see the numbers on this percent fitness plan use reported out by building um, for our comprehensives and for our choice schools. Um, and like I said, it's great to have a policy that it can be done, but to not have a district-wide, here's how you do it. I mean, you, in this presentation, told me that there are multiple times per year you can take the fitness test. Why aren't those dates available in our website? Okay. So. I think, just to respond to that, I think um, we, we are pushing that information through uh, um, connections mm -hmm. to parents and out to buildings to, for inclusion in their school newsletters. I think you're bringing up a good point in terms of- It needs to be on the website. The, because the it is on the website, but in terms of how you, you it. access yeah. it. I need the information now, yeah. not in the letter that I got three months ago. I think the issue is it is on the website. Mm -hmm. It's it just that, yes, it's, it's on just, the website, but the search function isn't, you're not getting not to impressed. it by putting those <laughs> key functions there. So, um, I can't off the top of my head remember which part of the website if you knew where it, it was, is. you can find it. Mm -hmm. If you can't it find it without knowing where it is, it's yeah. invisible and it doesn't count. Yeah, that's so, so we, that's that's good, good uh, feedback for us to take and ensure, because it's not, it's not yeah. our intent at all to keep the information from anyone. Right. Are you saying that the study guide for the PE exam is not online? That's also available on the, I know it is available. Yeah, it, and it, I think it's just, we have a new website. I yeah, think it's partly okay. just getting the, mm -hmm. the navigation figured out, but it's, we have the procedures and application timelines yeah. and all of that. And that the study, the category. actual mm -hmm. guide that yeah. the kids study. Okay, yes. because what I'm hearing from high schools is the kids have to come in and request the booklet and take it back to study, which makes it 
harder for running start students and kids who are off campus. I, I think there might be some process issues that are challenging we'll, in the we'll actual implementation that. that'll be worth figuring out. Um, much as what you're speaking to of that being an issue or the message not being out to students that's possible or I know access of when you can get in to actually put things in is limited. So I think that might just be mm -hmm. worth a yeah. once over. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> yep. I'll be very interested to see how the adaptive PE beyond elementary school gets developed and, and to the extent that it does. I'd like to suggest to y'all to take a look at or visit a PE class in middle or high school that is quote unquote inclusive of the special ed kids. I didn't catch the, uh, I'm sorry, Mark, did, did you say the name of that again? I would like to uh, suggest y'all that you drop by unexpectedly. Um, a PE class that has inclusive oh, you of the okay. uh, SPED kids. What you're going to find is something that would not be acceptable if you're talking about a race or ethnicity inclusiveness. You'll see them over in the corner of, this, of the gym kicking the ball between themselves at the most. You will not see them by and large included in the overall program. And to say that the prior, I, uh, in the past, that IEPs, if it called for uh, adaptive PE beyond elementary, uh, it didn't exist. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, I, I respect y'all and I like y'all, but uh, I can tell you as a parent, I was told by the middle school principal, you either take PE or you don't have it at all. There's nothing in between. Yeah. Forget it. Mark, I, I want to respond to that because I respect you and like you as well. And I know that you have shared your personal experience um, before, and we take that seriously. And if that has been your personal experience, which I believe you and you're sharing it, then that's then there are system issues that we need because that sh that's not appropriate. It's not um, reflective of what we want happening. I also want to share that I have firsthand knowledge of seeing it be effective and work. So I think that there are places we could go and visit. And again, it's maybe a number of years ago, but I'll just speak to Inglewood when, when I was principal at Inglewood. Again, that's been a lot of years ago now, but we had a transition uh, program and we had students included in PE actually you know, playing basketball along with the rest of the students in the basketball unit and actually um, uh, on the basketball team as well. And these are uh, transition students, so students who did spend the majority of their time um, in an alternate setting. And I know that that's not the only place where that was happening. Now, in any large system, I'm, I'm sure there are um, places where we could go to see things happening, whatever, whatever it is we're talking about, happening well and being implemented well. and potentially other places for whatever reason it's not being implemented well, and we need to ensure that it's being implemented well across the entire system. So I, I'm, I am appreciative of you sharing your personal experience, and uh, I know that there's also examples of it, it working, and we need to make sure it's working for all students everywhere. One last thing on that. I think we need to make sure that the physical education instructors understand how to bring transition kids into their program because we just got out of an IEP meeting and they were really trying hard, but I'm not sure they were succeeding. So if there is some kind of presentation or class or some resources they could have, that would be fantastic because I think it would make it more successful. I can say I've seen coaches that really tried hard. They really did. They didn't have a first clue as to how to help communicate with a, special, a lot of the special needs kids. Uh, I think it goes to the idea, just as we've talked about other classes of co-teaching, mm -hmm. I think it goes to the idea of more, uh, not just inclusion of the students, but inclusiveness between the teaching staffs. Yeah. And the more we have that, the more, whether it's PE, math, science, social studies, whatever, you're gonna see more success. And I do know that we, we have 
special services folks who do work with our PE teachers. So I guess the question is, you know, like Tracy was saying, we want to make sure it's happening across the system. But there are, and I've seen resources for adaptive PE and presentations. So sometimes it's just worth that check-in to make sure it's still in the system and still happening. So it's, we can do that. Along those lines, is, is in the plie framework, is there a feedback loop on evaluating how well it's being implemented by site? I mean, that's something that, I, I mean, I understand that there's the desire, but there's always that difference between implementation and mm -hmm. theory. So I, I, how do, is, this is for the concerns that Mark is expressing. How do we structure it such that if there are issues, that they sur get surfaced rapidly and hopefully addressed. I, I know we've brought in the additional um, teaching coaches. I don't. Are any of them trained in adaptive space? I mean, this is something that it's typically our special yeah. services department that works with PE yeah. teachers okay. and, and our PE leads. So we can. Okay. That's some all work we can dig into and yeah. just see what the state of support is. And remember, we also um, at, the, at least at the elementary level. And we're hiring 20 yeah. plus teachers a year, and so part yeah. of it is the onboarding as well that we right. need to be thinking about. Okay. Um, okay, other, anything else we want to dive into? Okay, hearing nothing. Let me find the agenda. It's Appendix D uh, and Appendix E. I found it very quickly when I just hmm? put in Appendix D and you can get the waiver form, the excuse for it. If you have to know how to spell it when you're looking for it, the search program's not working. All right. A great teacher told me, oh, why I asked that, how, how do you spell guitar? She said, go look it I up. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> yeah, how to spell it. How the hell come? Yeah. Great. All right. Great. Um, so we are on to the SOUPS report. Great. So tonight is uh, superintendent report on graduation rates. So remember, you can view this as sort of a precursor to ER1. This is not the full ER1 report, but we do have uh, updated graduation rate information for the class. 17, so typically we report that out in superintendent's report in December, so that is tonight. Uh, Matt's just going to click for me. And uh, again, this is connected to ER1, which is all about our mission and vision for students, which is focused on graduating students future ready. So for the class of 2017, here's the updated data. We had 1,743 total students in the graduating class of 2017. Of those students, 1,626 uh, graduated on time, meaning they graduated in the spring within the four-year on-time graduation uh, time frame, which uh, translates to 93.3% on-time graduation rate, which is great. It's an increase over um, the uh, previous year, and again, we're continuing to strive toward that target of 100%. Um, of the students who didn't graduate on time, there were 117 students. 67 of them are continuing with us. So uh, that means they're continuing to be enrolled and working toward completion of their graduation requirements. This continuing group of students also includes students who actually did meet the graduation requirements in their high school and are now in our 18 to 21 transition program. So they would be included in that 67. Of the 117 students who did not graduate on time, 50 of them are non-continuing, or essentially they, you know, are what you would call, you know, dropout. I just don't like that term, dropout. Um, however, that means potentially we have a potential if all 67 students complete their graduation requirements, we have the potential for a 97.1 extended graduation rate. That's pretty incredible, and uh, we're continuing to make all of these numbers be 100% because that's what we want for our students. Um, uh, just a couple more looks at the data so you can see that target remains 100% and you can see how the on-time graduation rate um, has, uh, you know, it, uh, not it increased greatly, but it's increased uh, slightly over previous years. It's on an upward trend. That's the magic 5% trend that I've been looking for. Across five years, you went up 5%. I believe that this is a trend. This isn't just random noise. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, extended graduation rate, you can see on this slide. Um, so these are students who, it's currently fifth year. OSPI starting to report out 
six and seven year graduation rates and that was shared recently with the board and so um, we will likely be able to start incorporating that into the full ER1 report. Uh, we, as we always do, we disaggregate by um, race and ethnicity and income. Tonight's just a very high level, so you'll see more when you see the full ER report, but you see we are um, still seeing gaps. Um, in, for some groups, the gaps appear to be closing. Uh, when you look at the last five years, and we're still, um, you know, we don't have the number size here, so it's uh, difficult to, Mm -hmm. um, tonight, dig too deep into the data, but um, here's a first blush view at uh, the disaggregated data. We also uh, look at um, income, and in the over the past several years, I think this is the next slide. Oh, uh, I will back up here. Um, we also look at gender. Uh, program participation in terms of ELL. So you'll see that we have the current ELL, exited ELL, never ELL. Here's another example, just interesting, of, um, mm -hmm. of the exited ELL being very close to um, never ELL. Mm -hmm. um, you can see special education. Uh, on the previous slide, and then uh, low income, or excuse me, on the previous display before ELL, low income, and, and 504. So we'll dig more deeply into this when we get to ER1, but just wanted to give you this level of the data tonight. The low income shows a solid trend going up Word as well. well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's another uh, celebration point for us. The other piece we've looked at is uh, a couple years ago when we started uh, doing this, we've been updating this chart, so you can just see another view of um, low income specifically in terms of the graduation rate, which is increasing, and then the numbers of students. So the other thing I just want to highlight is we have more, um, over the course of the year, I guess we'd have to actually average that out, but you know, we have 319, last year we had 346, in previous years it was in the 200s um, in terms of the total number, and then we always, um, further specify out of the total low-income students how many graduated on time, so that's the total N of low-income on-time graduates, how many uh, did not graduate on time, and then of the students who didn't graduate on time, how many are continuing with us, and then how many are not continuing. So, uh, for example, I just thought it was interesting when you look at 16 compared to 17, we have the the same, we have, um, what am I trying to say? The total um, continuing is the, let me back up a column, I apologize. The total non-low income, non-on-time graduates, it's uh, lower this year than it was last year. Uh, we have fewer in negative status <laughs> and uh, the same who, number that are continuing with us. So. That is uh, all the data we have to share tonight. Just a high level of updated graduation rates. Uh, we are uh, pleased with the data that we're seeing with the effort that we're making. We'll dig into uh, ER1 when we do the full ER1 presentation. Sorry, I was just trying to draw up the two by two tables to calculate some <laughs> odds ratios, but uh, any comments? Yeah. Uh, last, I want to say it was July, May, it was August. Right, we had our first. Oh, yeah, there you go. Oh, it was on. Excuse <laughs> me. Yeah, you can hear what the hell, it doesn't matter. As loud as I am, they can probably hear me in uh, Pasco anyway. Uh, last year, during the summer, y'all had, I guess, the first late graduation ceremony I attended. Mm -hmm. It was moving. There were only four students. But I tell you, they were as excited and engaged, if not more so, than any student I saw at Key Arena. Mm -hmm. And their parents were on cloud nine. And that's a program that I would love to see us continue. Now, if we have, if we have it beyond July, August, and there's a September graduation class, by God, I'd say have it too. Mm -hmm. Because those kids, 
I think each one of them only lacked one credit graduating. And they showed the initiative. They had, ha had faced some major obstacles, each one of them that I talked to, and they made it. And by God, that's something to celebrate, yeah. even though it's only four kids. Yeah, absolutely. Every single student matters. Just a, you had 50 non-continuing students. So what happens? Do we have a re-engagement process? Or is, is there a different type of outreach that's occurring? Well, um, one, of, one of the challenges we have is how do we, um, knowing where those students are, um, so f how the P210, which is our um, report, works, if the student, first the cohort of the graduating class of is established when the students enter ninth grade. And then if a student um, is with us in 10th grade, they're part of that cohort. If a student then moves to Issaquah, I'm just using that as an example, then they will get picked up in the Issaquah system and they get taken out of our cohort and they get put into Issaquah's cohort. Likewise, if a student moves to Lake Washington from Kent as an 11th grader, they get into our system, now they're part of our cohort and no longer in Kent. What happens, unfortunately, um, with some of the students is they get unconnected to our system because they're moving to or whatever and we don't know and they never get put into another system in Washington State. It may be that they've moved out of state. It may be that they've truly dropped out. So what part of our challenge is what we would love to do and we want to look at is how can we, do we have any information? Can we track down anything about those students who are not continuing with us and is there anything we can do to help re-engage them whether it's in our system or in a um, like a Lake Washington Institute of Technology has a grad program there's other programs that potentially could help students but just part of our challenge is being able to actually know where those students are mm -hmm. as I recall in one of the past years you'd mentioned also that if that student in his or her senior year enrolls or enlists in the in the military that you really don't have a way of tracking that jump either um, and the same way with the interstate if you will student is it possible that through legislative work with uh, perhaps uh, representative del bene or one of the other folks that we could encourage some legislation to be able to help track those students so to prevent the ones falling through the cracks, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, that would help know our uh, system know that we're actually getting those students, but also help the other systems. Mm -hmm. And with the idea being that the more we know of where they are or who they are, then we can find the ones who did fall through the cracks and help yeah. them. Yeah, that's a good point and a potential possibility. So you're right. What we do know is we get the data, it's, it's lagging a couple years behind. But we do get the data on how many students enroll in two or four year public or private institutes in Washington State. Right, in Washington. So for example, right now for the class of 2015, it's about 80%. What we don't know of the other 20%, are they enrolled in out of state? Are they enrolled in the military? Are they not enrolled in any post-secondary? So as part of ER1 is the, you know, not just graduating, but graduating future ready. We're wanting our students to go on to something post-secondary. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know right now of the 20% that aren't in the data that we do have, where are they? And I don't know if there's potentially a legislation or some something that could help, because we would sure like to know uh, how many are going out of state, how many are in military certificate programs, whatever that might not be in that in-state data set. So or I don't know if that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I sure. think it, uh, perhaps even working with the labor unions to find out how many of those kids might be in, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, apprenticeship programs because yeah, it's definitely a limitation in our current yeah. data system mm -hmm. any other I have none um, so I guess thank you yes which brings us to the legislative update anything interesting happening Mark Yes, uh, we <laughs> a lot of interesting things go on. <laughs> Productive, no, that's another story. Uh, we will be meeting uh, in the near future with our legislators, our local legislators. We also have meetings that will be beginning again with the uh, uh, the various city councils. Uh, 
uh, so we'll be working with them uh, to both personal and local, but also uh, in the statewide or the state issues. Um, and we'll look to see what we can do uh, to further these legislative agenda pieces and uh, help kids that are basically, help our gap kids, if you will, as well as the others. All right, um, any other? No, okay. Uh, board follow-up, so anything that we want to hit again from study session or earlier this evening? I'm gonna assume that anything that we asked for follow-up data on is gonna be presented. All right. <laughs> I just didn't hear what you said, I'm sorry. For, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that you've been taking notes and capturing the things that we've asked for data on and I have every <laughs> confidence that it will be produced. Yeah. So, so what you'll find is, um, yes, I take notes when, uh, about uh, data follow-up questions and then um, we do have a process for following up. There are um, some things that take longer than other things. Um, there are some things that, uh, so just with that, I'll keep communication with the board in terms of status on those things. And if there is something that, uh, typically if there's something that, you could also email me, um, if there's an area that isn't being followed up on. I mean, I think we have a pretty good system down, I guess, long, long answer to question. Yes, we will follow up on the follow-up questions. <laughs> and they can attest to that. Okay, um, future agenda items. I think we discussed a number that we're hoping to punt to the uh, extended work study session. I'm confident that Diane captured those. Anything else for the future agenda that's come up this evening? No, not really. Okay. Uh, debrief. I, I'm, debrief is usually just talking about structurally, how's this working? I like how the conversation went on the math thing. We're getting there. We'll figure this out. It's just we got room to improve by a significant margin. So anyway. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think Siri raised, I don't know, I think you said this on the microphone earlier. I can't remember anymore. Uh, that we should uh, memorialize our procedures, put mm -hmm. in writing how we're going about these ER reports. As and, they and, and yeah, and particularly in advance of the ER3 yeah. uh, report, I think we should try to do that. So yeah. I'm not volunteering myself for that. I was just saying that we, we the, not the, yeah, we Don't as worry, the board. That's a lot easier to yeah. write. Than the we summary. actually currently have it. Yeah. It's just it's that just it's been awesome. revised. Right. Um, and I think it's still probably the going edits. to be revised. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure we're quick quite following through with everything in the time that we've stated. So this I think there's a combination of components yeah. we have to work on. If it'd be helpful, I can resend that document from March that has the procedures hurt. outlined. It would be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and board member comments. So I, I think we can merge board member We're comments. We're off for the rest of the year. Uh, well, <laughs> as long as you're working on a calendar year, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, may I make yes, uh, go ahead. two comments? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say again, welcome to Cassandra. It's oh, yeah. great to have you officially here. Uh, you know, you've been to coming to study sessions and board meetings and now to yeah, actually have you sworn job. in and a board member and here in the dais participating. Just great. It's great to have you here. So thank you. It's fun to be able to finally talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And then my second comment is, so we have our newest board member, and we also have our um, eldest, I'm not sure what to, you're not senior the eldest, board senior point. board member. And we have, uh, uh, we received from the Washington State School Directors Association, uh, Chris's uh, recognition certificate in recognition and appreciation of your 10 years 10 years of valuable service to the children of Washington State. So I wanted to uh, yeah. present to you your certificate from WASDA for your 10 years of service. So, yay, well, Thank you. Oh. All right. Well, oh dear, I'm behind on closing us out for the evening. But all right. Um, so our next board meeting will be on January 8th, uh, 5 p.m., joint study session with Sammamish City Council. Looking forward to that. Uh, topic being bond and levy information campaign. Um, and then at seven o'clock, we'll have a board meeting here in the boardroom. Uh, I'll now ad entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by Director La Liberty, seconded by Director Bliesner. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, hearing none, motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.